Uh, now it is live. Uh, Dr. Salman. Dr. Salman, now you can uh, present your slides okay, for moderation. For moderation. Thank okay, you so much. Okay, thank you, ma'am. <laughs> A very good morning to all of you present here in this event. It is an honor to be here with you today. I, Dr. Salman Khan from School of Life Science and Technology, IMT University welcomes the dignitaries, participants and students on the behalf of Microbiologist Society of India and IMT University in the inaugural session of International Conference on Advances in Biotechnology and Applied Microbiology. Thanks to be the warm responses to the conference, we have received almost 100 abstracts for the oral presentations. Now I would like to present a small presentation on, about, on our university, about the conference and what... Okay, so uh, IMT University merit immense pleasure and feels honored in inviting the contributors across the globe and attending this conference. Uh, this conference is being organized by School of Life Science and Technology in association with Microbiology Society India to provide an opportunity to research scholars, delegates and students to interact and share their experiences experiences and knowledge in the field of biotechnology and microbiology. The aim of the conference to be provide a platform to the researchers from both academia as well as industry to meet the share cutting edge development in the field of biotechnology and applied microbiology. This conference uh, would bring together biotechnologists, microbiologists, professors, researchers, scientists, business leaders, industry safety officers, environmental and plant scientists, postdoctor fellows of different universities, vendors of consumer products, managers, pharmaceutical scientists, students from the biotechnology and microbiology and its allied areas to share novel approaches and exploring the challenges concerning excellence in research and advancements. There are different scientific sessions uh, would be there in the conference. Uh, number one would be soil and agriculture biotechnology, industrial and microbial biotechnology, food biotechnology, microbiology, aquaculture and marine biotechnology, nanobiotechnology and engineering, medical microbiology and immunology, environmental biotechnology, microbiology, and last but the not, not the least, for, uh, predictive microbiology and machine learning. This university holds a unique place in Indian university system. It was established in 2016 to meet the demand of the local community. The university aims to be a world-class university. It is committed to academic excellence by creating academic courses re related to uh, entrepreneurship, developing creativity and innovation amongst our students, establishing a technology incubator, startup center, and creating a research and entrepreneurship park. The university has been working with determination to have a variety of programs, which are part of curricula and prepare in consultation with industry. At the IMT University, we believe in the same knowledge power, and that's true. Our main objectives has been developing the young learners on the solid foundations of ethical and moral values. While polishing the leadership quality, research culture and innovative skills built on a very huge green campus, we have excellent infrastructure facilities helping creating a higher teaching and learning environment and research. 
the university provides higher education of global standards and because of this the all the programs are designed as per the international standards as far as our school of life science technology are an integral part of the scientific studies it basic basically consists of scientific studies of life and organism comprehensive microorganism plants and animal including human beings at the department of biotechnology and microbiology the university offers undergraduate degree courses in the field of uh, bsc microbiology biotechnology and postgraduate level degree courses in the field of zoology microbiology and biotechnology there are various courses offered from our department itself it is bsc in biology bsc in microbiology and biotechnology and master programs in microbiology biotechnology and zoology and also phd course as far as the microbiology society of india is concerned this society was established in the march 1996 and registered in the november 1996 in the satara maharashtra india the aim and objective of the societies are to organize courses in microbiology at the level of education to cultivate license between government and non government institution academics society and other organization non organization in the field of microbiology to advise the government and its agencies on the microbiological problems of public interest to cooperate and affiliate the international organization in the field of microbiology to hold the sponsors or support conference seminar symposia exhibition and meetings to the arrange lectures and demonstration of any aspect of microbiology to encourage support research in microbiology to establish library of microbiology literature to arrange funds and donation etc for promotion of the subject activities to do and perform all other activities that that may assist in the fulfillment of the above mentioned objective so so these are some overviews of the conference and about our university and the society and the now, now, now i would like to invite our honorable vice chancellor ma'am dr deepa sharma to please say something about the conference welcome ma'am uh, thank you salman warm good morning to uh, all the uh, dignitaries and uh, all the speakers and participants present on the platform i deepa sharma on behalf of amt university welcome you all and i congratulate uh, dr navneet sharma dr shubha devedi dr mukta sharma uh, dr salman and their other team members for organizing such a uh, platform uh, to share the views on the recent trends in the area as such as as such myself is uh, not uh, from the field of biotechnology and the microbiology but as far as uh, the recent trends which are going on in the biotechnology industry and i understand they are the areas in which a lot is going on like artificial intelligence big data gen- gene editing precise medicine gene sequencing biomanufacturing synthetic biology bioprinting microfluids tissue engineering nanotechnology etc and if you talk about the recent publications in the field then there is a lot of literature which are available on exploiting the unconventional prokaryotic host for industrial biotechnology for progresses and challenges in mass spectroscopy based analysis of the antibodies uh, 3d uh, bioprinted cancer on a chip level up organotypic in vitro models safety evaluation of transgenic and genome edited food animals then uh, multi product bio refineries from marines power biology nitrogen removal from the environment by using the geo batteries reap the uh, crop wild relatives for breeding future crops customizing lipids for uh, oligonos microbes etc so these are the recent uh, like uh, literature as far as my knowledge is concerned which are available so uh, i uh, i feel that this is a, a wonderful platform on which the different dignitaries and the speakers participants present they will share their views on the recent trends in the field of biotechnology microbiology and their application in the different areas like in the food industry 
in uh, uh, tech industry and uh, uh, in uh, life sciences. So uh, I uh, once again, uh, I uh, extend my sincere thanks for uh, uh, giving me the opportunity to inaugurate this uh, uh, wonderful platform of sharing the knowledge. And uh, from my side, I wish all the best to all the participants. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for your kind words. You have elaborated on the latest uh, trend, uh, trends in microbiology and biotechnology, and that would be very helpful for the participants and also for the dignitaries. Now, I would like to invite uh, Professor uh, Namneet Sharma, sir, at Dean uh, School of Life Science Technology, uh, IMT University, uh, to say a few words about the conference. Please, sir. Thank you, Dr. Salman. Good morning to all the present dignitaries of today's event. Our own Honorable Vice Chancellor, Man, Professor Deepak Sharma, Man. my dear fellow colleagues, deans of the different colleges of IIMT University, participants, dear faculty members, and students. As you all know, today is a very auspicious day that we are organizing an international conference in association with the Microbiology Society of India. It's my pleasure to welcome you all on this event on behalf of School of Life Science and Technology, faculty members and students, I welcome all of you. First of all, I would like to thank our Chancellor Sir, Shri Yogesh Monji Gupta, who has encouraged us to organize such type of activities and provided all the facilities which were required for such organization. I would also like to thank our uh, pro-chancellor, Sir Shri Mayank Agarwalji, who is a young dynamic leader to help us in organizing this conference. Our own Vice Chancellor Men, Professor Deepa Sharma Men, who has always a source of beckon to all of you, all the faculty members and the students in organizing all these scientific activities. As we all know that uh, IMT University has the incubator center and R&D cell. And under the guidance of Professor Deepa Sharma, Men, we used to organize international conferences, seminars, webinars, MDPs, STPs, awareness drives, IIC activities. We are highly thankful to you, Men, for providing us the platform for organizing such type of activities. It is your source of inspiration, your constant motivation that you people are able to do such type of activities. We are delighted to have distinguished guests in the field of microbiology and biotechnology who have the stalwart of their field. I would like to welcome Professor A.M. Deshmukh sir, who is the president of Microbiology Society of India. Welcome sir. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you, sir. We have our uh, Professor A.P. Garg, sir, who is the source of inspiration for young scientists, budding researchers, who is the director of research and former vice chancellor of Shobit University. Thank you, sir, for sparing time of this event. We have international is also Professor Jaipal Singh, Principal Scientist, Formative Analysis, Los Angeles, USA, and Professor Arthi Dubey, sir, Professor at the Gurukul Kandi University, Haridwar. I again welcome all the dignitaries who are the witness of today's organization to this uh, inaugural ceremony. Thank you, sir. Dear participants, delegates, as we know that today is the after pandemic, after 2019 pandemic COVID-19, the whole world is seeing B people. B people means biotechnologist, microbiologist, biochemist, and chemist. You see, the million of deaths had occurred in this pandemic, and at last, it were B people, it were the microbiologist, it was the biotechnologist who invented the vaccine, and finally, we are on the verge of this pandemic to be the Endemic. So, a big congratulations to all the our colleagues, our fraternity members that they have done the marvelous job on this. My dear delegates, we will be having two days journey here 
starting from today to tomorrow's evening in during the session as dr salman explained that we have session on different different topics that has been coordinated very well by the organization members i wish all the best to the organization team and dear delegates that it will be a fruitful conference for we people thank you again welcome from my empty university thank you very much thank you dr salman over to you thank you thank you so much sir the sir is you know elaborated on science uh, related to microbiology and biotechnology to the delegates uh, thank you so much sir for your precious word uh, albert einstein once said the important thing is to never stop question so that's how science is working around the world uh, scientists always question to the different kind of hurdles and that's true now i would like to invite uh, the president of the microbiology society of india professor uh, professor deshmukh sir to to invite uh, for a uh, brief words please sir thank you thank you very much dr salman thank you for sir. calling me in this august gathering in the early morning and uh, very excellent topic that is advances in biotechnology and applied microbiology by i am i am t university mirat so as a president of microbiology society we have already collaborated your university and i am very delighted to know that more than 100 abstract you have received throughout india from different corners of india honorable vice chancellor dr deepa ma'am already have told the importance of microbiology and biotechnology i am also happy to see dr amar garg today in this event it means that this event is a very very important event because many speakers have noted they are also very well reputed scientists of the india they have agreed to deliver the lecture today this topic you see it is a not only need of the today it is need of the future because i believe that many other sciences require for the development of human being but microbiology and biotechnology is required for existence of human being you see development comes after existence whether we will survive on the earth or we will not survive on the earth is decided by microbiology and biotechnology there is a always a tension of war we are experiencing ukraine war but after few years or now only there is a possibility of bioterrorism bio war it is also related with the microbiology so it is your duty it is my duty to educate the society regarding different useful aspect and harmful aspects of the microbiology and biotechnology so today's conference will definitely educate the teachers researchers industrialist and ultimately layman common man because today's attendee will work as a ambassador they will transfer the knowledge to their colleges respective colleges university students again as a president of microbiology society i am thankful to the head of the department dr navneet 
Dr. Mukta Sharma was constantly in touch with me. I am thankful to the team of microbiology and biotechnology department, which is involved in organizing today's event. I am thankful to Honorable Vice Chancellor of the University. Thanks to all. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir, for your precious word. Dr. A.B.J. Abdul Kalam once said, science is a beautiful gift to humanity and we should not destroy it. Now, I would like to invite our convener of this conference, Professor Mukta Sharma Ma'am, to enlighten us to say a few words about this conference. Welcome, Ma'am. Thank you so much, Dr. Salman. A very good morning to our honorable guests, enthusiastic participants, and my dear students. On behalf of the School of Life Science and Technology, IIMT University Mayor, I would like to declare that the first international conference on advances in biotechnology and applied microbiology is now open. As we open this conference, it gives us a great pleasure to welcome all of you. This international conference we named ICABAM 2022 is being organized in the collaboration with the Microbiology Society of India. I would like to express my gratitude and warm welcome to our plenary and featured international and national keynote speakers. We would like to express heartfelt gratefulness to the Vice Chancellor of the IMT University, Professor Deepa Sharma Ma'am, and the Dean School of Life Science and Technology, Dr. Navni Sharma Sir, for making this conference possible. All of our eminent keynote speakers are very special and have been selected carefully so that all the participants have variety of topics and benefit from their knowledge. And uh, now I would like to introduce them to us. In this conference, we have eight keynote sessions. First of all, I would like to welcome Professor A.M. Deshmukh sir. He is the president of MSI, ex-professor and had Department of Microbiology, Dr. Uh, Babasar Ambedkar University, Usmanabad. Welcome, sir. Now, I would, I would like to welcome Professor A.P. Girl, sir, former professor and head Department of Microbiology, CCS University, Meerut, Pro-VC at JNU, uh, Jaipur, and former Vice Chancellor of the Shobit University, and currently he is working as a Dean and Director of Biotechnology at Shobit University, Meerut. I welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to welcome Professor R.C. Dubey, sir. He is Professor and Head, Department of Microbiology, Gurukul Kangri University, Haridwar, and Dean Research and Director of the IQAC of the University. I welcome you, sir. Next, I, uh, I would like to welcome our international speaker, Dr. Jagpal Singh, sir. He is Principal Scientist, Formative LLC, Los Angeles, California. Welcome you, sir, in the conference. Next, I welcome Dr. Shalini Singh. She is the Senior Scientist as Biology Works, California, USA. I welcome Dr. Shalini. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Gokul Shankar, sir. He is the Professor and Head, Department of Microbiology, Manipal University College, Malaysia. Uh, I welcome you, sir. Now, I would like to welcome Dr. Swarnima Agnihotri. She is Associate Professor, University of Godar, Sweden. I welcome you, Dr. Swarnima. It is a privilege to have all of you here. Our thanks and appreciation go to all the national and the international speakers. Uh, in this conference, we received uh, approximately 120 abstracts, out of which approximately 90 will be presented during the oral presentation session. We hope this conference will help you better understand subject of the biotechnology and obtain the knowledge necessary to improve the state of the subject in our country. We truly value your participation and support for this conference. Thank you so, so much for coming and for your kind attention and the participation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone. Over to you, Dr. Salman. Next session is our uh, keynote session. 
This session will be moderated by the Dr. Garima. Now I invite Dr. Garima Bhattaria. Thank you, Professor Mukta Sharma, ma'am, for giving me such a opportunity to handle my for today's keynote session. So, respected keynote speakers, faculty members, research scholars, and other participants, a very good morning to all of you. I am Dr. Garima from School of Life Science and Technology of IIT University. Warmly welcomes you in today's keynote session. The first day session of this two days conference having four well-known personalities of their field. It is my honor to introduce them as a speaker for today's e event. They have come from across the country to share their valuable knowledge and took out their valuable time to join us today. Now, it is a moment of extreme pleasure to welcome Professor A.M. Deshmukh, sir, President of Microbiological Society India, Professor Deshmukh is ex-professor head of the department of microbiology and from Dr. Baba Sahab Ambedkar, Marathwara University, Osamabad. He has published more than 80 national and international research papers with several research projects and books. Deshmukh sir has organized approximately 50 national and international conferences seminars and workshops in India and abroad. He is also chief editor of Journal of Microbial World and chairman of Board of Studies in Microbiology. Sir has visited as keynote speaker in Mauritius, Japan, Malaysia, USA, France, Germany, UK, China, Nepal, Bhutan, Bangladesh, Dubai, and Sri Lanka. So it's a huge list. Sir so was a research person in 20, 285 college and universities. Now we request the honorable speaker to address the listeners and cast the light of his knowledge upon us. So welcome uh, Dr. Deshmukh sir. So please start your session. Thank you. Thank you madam for giving me an opportunity to interact with the microbiologist and biotechnologist of India. Uh, I will be happy if you allow me to share my screen. Please. Yes, sir. Uh, you can share, sir. You can share. Sir. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. So, Today I will be talking as in the inauguration function, Dr. Salman has told, different fields will be covered during this national conference. So among them, one of the very innovative and very interesting field is nanoparticles. So, Little bit, I will go to the history of nanoparticles. So first off, whenever we are talking about the nanoparticles, we will not forget the great scientist, Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman, he was, he was, he is considered as a father of nanotechnology. And his sentence is a very important sentence because nowadays also everyone is thinking about the big, big and mega. Everyone was trying to make the mega things. But he told that why you are after only mega, mega and mega? You think of micro, micro and micro. So his sentence was, there is a plenty of room at the bottom. Exactly reverse to the common statement that there is a plenty of room at the top. But he told exactly reverse. There is a plenty of room at the top meaning is that he believed that Whenever we'll go to small and small things, 
they have miracle properties that can be exploited by the human being. And he first time published a paper and in the writing of the Richard Feynman is given in his handwriting. Uh, he has uh, written the things about the nanotechnology. Now I cannot cover totally the history of nanotechnology, but I'm coming to the nanobiotechnology. You see again, anything have three different ways for the biosynthesis. One is a physical way, second is a chemical way, third is a biological way. So whenever nanoparticles actually, when man was not knowing biological synthesis of nanoparticles, at, he was at that time, there was a physical ways and chemical ways to synthesize nanoparticles. But later on scientists found that biological synthesis of nanoparticle is a cheaper, very effective and eco-friendly possibility. So the attempts of nanoparticle synthesis by with the help of plants and microorganisms, you see. One of my friends who is a vice chancellor at Gulbarga University now, Dr. Dayanand, I have visited his laboratory many times. He is working on biosynthesis of nanoparticle with the help of plants. But with the help of microorganism, is it possible? Yes, it is possible to synthesize nanoparticle with the help of plants, with the help of microorganisms. Which microorganism? Of course, I devoted my life because 17 PhD students I have produced and all of them were from actinomycetes. Of course, one of my students, he tried to synthesize nanoparticle with the help of streptomyces species. And he got success in that. So that story I'm going before that historical background. So the nanoparticle were being used in use in the history. So in the Ajanta and Erola caves, the colors which are used, they are said to be of nanoparticle. Then in the nature, you see, in the nature, golden peacock. So their wings have colors with the nanoparticle. So nanoparticles are already present in nature. Nanoparticles were already being used, but we got the knowledge now. And one of the pioneer industry, again, I will tell you, IBM, which is settled in USA, established in USA, IBM has concentrated on nanoparticle synthesis and they got much success. Many discoveries are on the credit of IBM. So, Latron in 1974, nanotechnology terminology by one Japanese scientist was given the name <laughs> nanotechnology. And then there were many, many discoveries Carbon nanotubes were discovered, buckyball was discovered, and uh, atomic force microscope was invented by then nano medicines. Now in Pune, in Maharashtra, one of my friends produced nanoparticle uh, therapy for covering the wounds, and he got a patent on it. Is it possible? Yes, it is also possible. And it is possible even in the future. The first nanotechnology, as I have told you, in the Ajanta and Erola Kios. Again, the second slide I have just told you. So what is a nanoparticle? The creation of functional material. Nano, nano means what? The scale is that 1 to 100 nanometer size. Generally, 
the na particles which are having size 1 to 100 nanometer we call it as a nano particle and what is a very important property of the nano particle for any particle if we cut cut and cut and prepare a smaller and smaller size so when we reduce the size it is observed that properties of that metal get changed you see it was a very very new discovery new invention that if the golden color is a the gold have a golden color please bottle me do pardon pardon ma hello mai to yes sir you are audible sir audible ko fire ani thi fir aap and when we reduce size the property get change i was telling you what is the color of gold you will laugh at me sir golden color gold have but if we cut down into smaller size the color of gold change that is a novel property so what is a novel property it becomes whenever we cut it into smaller pieces it becomes more and more strong and whenever it becomes more and more strong the efficiency of nano particle so what we need today we need efficiency and the nano particle are giving these nano particles are used now in many fields they have wide application in physics they have wide application in chemistry with the biology also the artificial intelligence just you are telling one of the point is artificial intelligence uh, i request again please mute the mic someone mic is open and admin admin can mute the mic admin can mute the mic can you tell me the name who is who mic is open i can tell easily i am requesting you please mute your mic please those admin who can are interested those who are not interested to listen they, they can leave but they yeah. must uh, mute the mic and they must i am again requesting you all please mute your mic उनके पास गवर्नमेंट की बीएस स्कीम है उसके अंदर करवाते हैं ये अठारह छह महीने भी था छह महीने का था ओके नहीं मैंने उसको पहले ही बोल दिया था भाई तुम्हारी दस बार इच्छा हो तो करना नहीं तो यहाँ करवा रहा हूँ नहीं मैं मुझे अच्छा करना है वहाँ The participant who is using the iPhone, please mute yourself. बस बार इच्छा हो सोच लो आराम से मैंने उसको बहुत टाइम लिया था छह महीने दिया दिया participants please I'm requesting you to mute your mic. If you are not interested, then you can leave the meeting. काम कर लिया ना? The admin can remove them. Admin can remove. Admin please remove the iPhone. It is showing the iPhone. हेलो प्रोफेसर प्रोफेसर देशमुख देशमुख सर यस देशमुख सर यू आर एडमिन एक्चुअली यू आर एडमिन नाउ ओके 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 आई विल आई विल नाउ इट इज माय रिक्वेस्ट एक्चुअली आई आई ट्रांसफर्ड माय 
uh, I make you as a host actually right now, na. So you okay, just okay. you, you directly okay, uh, you directly uh, remove that part uh, participant. Yes, 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 yes. I will. I will make. I will make. Just yeah. one minute. One minute, please. The admin. I am admin. Can you make you admin? Um. Sir, so, uh, so you are admin. admin. You are admin now, sir. You are admin actually. Yeah. Ruchi Shankar. Uh, then Shubha Dwe Dwedi. Uh, Doctor Shubha Dwedi, myself. Okay, Doctor Garima, mic is open. Sir, I am the moderator. Okay, oh. sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> sorry, sir. Ruchi Shankar, Ruchi Shankar, mic is open. Ruchi Shankar, mic is open. करना चाहे तो कर. Okay. So I will make you admin, ma'am, so that you can. Uh, I'm requesting to Dr. Shubha Dubedi, ma'am, please uh, take admin right to yourself and Papi remove the I iPhone. Just wait, ma'am. Actually, uh, yes, I am taking that. Uh, just wait. Uh, okay, ma'am. Okay. I have made you co-host. Shubha, ma'am. I have made you co-host. Actually, I am seeing right now, I, I didn't find any of the participant. Dr. Shubha, uh, she is Dr. Richa Bhardwaj. Dr. Richa Bhardwaj. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I will make. I will uh, make. Sir, you can, uh, sir, you can continue with your lecture. Uh, I'm just saying this. I'm just saying this okay. matter. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I will continue my lecture. Very sorry, sir, for the interruption. Okay. Okay. No problems. It happens. No problem. So can you see my slide again? Yeah, we can see your slide, sir. Yes. कोई किसी और चल रहा है। डॉक्टर डॉक्टर शिवा दिव्यदी इस ट्राइंग टू रिसोल्व द मैटर। प्लीज वेट अ वाइल्ड। अच्छा किसी के चल रहा है। अरे देशमुख नहीं है मुझे लग रहा है देशमुख। Yes, someone is there। देशमुख का। Someone Mike's is there। Actually, they have started mic and discussing somewhere in the room. Yes, sir. I'm very sure, sir, sir. Someone is discussing on the hmm. conference. I'm Welcome. not aware of. Amar so, Garg. Hai. Welcome. <laughs> okay. It seems that. Okay, sir. I think the interview has stopped. So yes. please, uh, please continue Alles your session, sir. Please, sir, continue your session. Yes. So, let us go to the nanotechnology, how it is applicable in physics, in chemistry, in biology, in material science, in information technology, in mechanical engineering, and in electrical engineering. Then, I'm comparing the size of nanoparticle. If we consider the size of molecule, size of nanoparticle, size of viruses, size of bacteria, size of nuclei. So, uh, just again, I will find out. I will find out. Deepa, who is Deepa? Deepa, Deepa. Yes, I have closed Deepa. I have made her muted. Okay. Now I. Yes, everyone is mute now. Okay, thank you. So, so you can continue, sir. I have reclaimed yes. my host, right? So you just continue, sir. Okay, okay. Thank you so much, Shubham. So please continue. Yes. So, what are the 
more virtues we are getting by making them nanoparticles. First thing is that high surface area we are getting. High surface area to volume. Whenever we cut any particle into two pieces, the surface area is increased. Then the other properties are also changed. Which are the other properties? Melting point, reactivity, conductivity, strength, and light emission. All these get changed whenever we convert them into the smaller and smaller size. So I will go a little fastly because they increase with the high conductivity. That's why you see these nanoparticle, nanofibers, you might be knowing the importance of nanofibers now. They have super conductivity, super reactivity. They have super strength and they have super durability. So they can be used in vehicle because they are lighter in weight, but more durable. So in the plane, they can be used because they have super durability. And they are used in place of steel because of their property and many other properties they have that's why they are being used in human activities and these nanoparticles they are called different terminologies are there nano object nanoparticle nanotechnology agglomerate so like that various uh, terminologies are being used aggregate engineer nanoparticle, nanorod, fullerene. I will not go in detail, but just different nanowire, carbon nanotube, nanomaterial. So like this, the different names are there. Size, shape, morphology, surface area, chemical composition, and surface functionalization. It changed when we convert the material into nanoparticles. So, Again, these are the different parts. Let us go fastly and we'll see the size of effect on coloration. Means these are the colors of the same metal. Same metal, but having different sizes of nanoparticles. Whenever the same metal have different sizes nanoparticle, you see the change in color shape. And that is the thing that nanoparticles, whenever change their size, they change their properties. Now, if you want, you know, if you are interested to study nanoparticle, we require generally these different instrumentation. Transmission electron microscopy, EDX, energy dispersive X-ray spectroscopy, X-ray diffraction analysis, Atomic force microscopy, UV visible spectroscopy, everyone is having in every lab. And FTR, Fourier transmission micro, uh, microscopy. So these are the different material you see. I have given the different instrumentation and uh, EDX. I have given the X-ray diffraction, these photographs. And I'm coming to the point, small, lightweight, novel property. And Mira Lokesh Mandir bhi hai, Mira Nia Kapoor bhi hai, Manas Mathur bhi hai, bhoat loob hai. Again, someone has unmuted. Let us see who has unmuted. Let us check again. Someone has unmuted his or her mic. Okay, I'm, I cannot find. Okay. So let us come to the microbiology because after all, after all these, because these are the many slides, uh, one of the slide here, everything is made up of nanoparticles. And on the TV now, there are clothes, stainless clothes, they are made up of nanoparticles. 
so application is easy there application in market because uh, your theme is applied microbiology applied nanobiotechnology yes it is there now in the market the clothes with the nano particle here fifth one is a cloth with the nano particle so uh, let us go to the uh, microbiology now because i will go to the uh, streptomyces so there are different processes in the formation synthesis i will go to the actinomyces just with this background i am coming to the actinomyces they are very interesting i thought actinomyces are prokaryotic and uh, next i am going to the streptomyces which is one of the important genera of actinomyces actinomyces are prokaryotic filamentous and the filamentous property i have exploited to synthesize nanoparticle because the diameter of actinomyces or streptomyces is very less than diameter of fungal hyp that advantage is used in synthesis of nanoparticle so the actinomyces are the prokaryotic and heterotrophic microorganism all of them are gram positive in nature and her scientists first time discovered that actinomyces so what my one of the phd student did it. he isolated 40 actinomyces from the soil and studied for the metal properties what he checked first he checked whether these actinomyces are tolerant to metal then and then they can synthesize the nanoparticle he isolated few streptomyces we have concentrated only on four streptomyces species which were resistant to the metal they grow in presence of the metal and for that purpose we i we obtain the soil <coughs> for the isolation of the nanoparticle uh, soil used was from the mines where the metals are these soils have microorganism resistant to the metal four selected and identified up to species level and one of my phd student worked on it and he had electron microscopic photograph of the four different species of the streptomyces latron they were identified with the help of biochemical and the uh, 16s r rna characteristic so biochemical characterization for actinomyces different sugars it is not like our e coli salmonella we have to test the sugar on solid media they were tested names given were the different names were given k5 k9 k belongs to the karad karad is the name of city and we did the isolation of these nano particle characterization sorry of actinomyces k5 k9 k27 and k38 and latron they were identified so they were identified as streptomyces species k5 another streptomyces k27 third streptomyces k38 is a unidentified actinobacterium it is actually actinobacterium but it is unidentified and then we studied biosynthesis of gold nanoparticle so the gold nanoparticle the aurium chloride was used as the salt and we tried to synthesize in the screw capped bottle nanoparticle color of the broth was changed after 5 days after 7 days incubation then they were tested here again the biosynthesis of silver nanoparticle color get changed biosynthesis of manganese nanoparticle so the first property how to identify the color get changed and whenever there is a change in color 
you get a guarantee that nanoparticles are synthesized in your body. These nanoparticles are of two types. Few are intracellular nanoparticles. Few are extracellular nanoparticles. How to identify? By electron microscope, we can locate. We can also determine the shape of nanoparticles. Whether it is a square in shape, whether it is a triangle in shape, whether it is a circular in shape or any other shape it has. We can identify size of the nanoparticle also. So, what is the size of nanoparticle? We can purify it and after purification, we can test the different properties of nanoparticles. How we can test the different properties of nanoparticles? We can test antimicrobial property because they are playing very important role in inhibiting the growth of microorganism. And you know, at present, there is a major problem of antibiotic resistance. It is predicted that in 2025, the antibiotic resistance problem will increase in the world. So these nanoparticles in the future will help in killing the pathogenic microorganism and healing the wound. So biosynthesis of nanomagnesium nanoparticle, my student did in laboratory. They were tested by the UV visible spectroscope photometry. They were confirmed by EDX, by X-ray diffraction, by FTIR. Various instruments were used by my student. And he determined the size, he determined the shape, and he tested the antibiotic uh, property of this nanoparticle. And that antibiotic property can be used in the future. Even you see, nowadays, every article can be prepared, as I told you, nanofibers had made a great revolution. Even the clothes made up of nanoparticles. Our glass of the car can be prepared of nanoparticles, so unbreakable glass. Like that many things, colors of nanoparticles are there. Many, many things of the nanoparticle. It has a very wide application. So whenever the nanoparticles were synthesized, then the ultraviolet spectroscopy of gold nanoparticle was carried out. And it was observed that the peak after means at 550 nanometer wavelength. Means we get a peak at particular point. Then we can say that the nanoparticle is synthesized. So for the gold nanoparticle, silver nanoparticle, likewise, after, then what we did? My PhD student, what he did? He tried to optimize synthesis of nanoparticle. At what pH? At what timing? He observed that at 72 hours, there is a maximum production of nanoparticle. So the pH, slightly alkaline pH, he observed that is the optimum for biosynthesis of nanoparticle. And he studied for zinc also, he studied for magnets. So gold, silver, zinc, and magnets, four metals we undertook for the study. Of course, his study was very primary. Later on, he concentrated only on a gold and silver nanoparticle. So he studied optimization of gold nanoparticle and he effect of aurium chloride concentration. So which concentration should be used for the biosynthesis of nanoparticle that he studied and at a different four concentrations he used and his observation I will give. Then effect of aurium chloride concentration, uh, same, sorry, it is a, not aurium chloride, it is silver chloride. So first is aurium chloride, then silver. Then he used the gold and silver nanoparticle effect of pH. What is the effect of pH? Just I have told you. 6.5 to 7. P 
pH is optimum for gold uh, and silver nanoparticle. For gold, 6.5 to 7. For silver, it is 7 to 7.5 is the optimum pH for the silver nanoparticle synthesis. Then, what we did? He studied scanning electron microscope of the filaments before exposure to the silver nitrate and after exposure to the silver nitrate. He observed that the mycelium were plain without deposition of any particle, but after exposure, small dots are observed in the filaments and these dots were of the nanoparticle synthesis. Then he did the partial purification of the nanoparticle and then he observed scanning electron microscope under it, the partially purified nanoparticle. So you see, if any one of you are interested in that, you can also work on that. And X-ray diffraction study was also carried out. So the X-ray diffraction study also told that purified nanoparticle, X-ray diffraction studies, then EDX studies, which are used for measurement of the size and measurement of the shape of the nanoparticle. So X-ray diffraction was also carried out. And we observed that circular in shape nanoparticle and size was approximately 20 nanometer. So that size was there. Transmission electron microscope study was also carried out. And you see the observation of the circular shape nanoparticle before exposure and after exposure. Before exposure, they were metal salts, metal particles. After exposure, these black spots are converted into very fine spots. Fine spots of gold nanoparticle. It is only because of the actinomycetes. Our observation was that they are intracellular actinomycetes. But after lysis of the cell, these intracellular nanoparticles come outside. And these are the photographs of the nanoparticle which are uh, synthesized by the four different species of the streptomyces. So you see, these are the photographs of silver nanoparticle. First, I have given you gold. Second, silver. And then again, the uh, silver nanoparticle before and after the exposure. And then my PhD student, he worked on antimicrobial activity of silver nanoparticle. He tested only metals. He tested only the act actinomycetic broth, streptomyces broth, without nanoparticle. He tested all controls. And lastly, he tested the sample, which sample in which the nanoparticles are synthesized. And he found that the diameter of inhibition, zone diameter inhibition in millimeter is increased with the nanoparticle. So again, he has calculated, I have not given in detail. Here, in, I have not presented, but he has calculated statistical difference also. Because anything, whenever I'm making a statement in microbiology without statistic, it is useless. That's why it is always said that microbiology should go along with the statistic, along with the computer. All sciences are now intermingled with each other. No science we can separate. That's why in many universities, it is a department of life science. Because botany, zoology, biochemistry, nanobiotechnology, microbiology, all these comes under one umbrella, life science, like that. Now there is a need of statistic. My PhD student, he determined the statistical difference and whether it is a significant or not, he found there is a significant difference in the uh, antibiotic 
sorry, in the inhibition of the microorganism, pathogenic microorganism like Salmonella, Candida, Escherichia coli, gram positive Bacillus megatherium, Staphylococcus, gram positive pathogenic organism, and Bacillus tiarothermophilus. So, in this manner, he studied in detail and he found that it can be used, and it can be applied. So, in this manner, these are the references for the study and uh, you can also go in detail. If any one of you interested in the study of nanoparticle synthesis with the help of microorganism, uh, micro there is a huge scope for the research for this type of topic. I'm thankful to again, I'm thankful to the organization IIMT University I'm thankful to Honorable Vice Chancellor as well as I'm thankful to the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity. I'm thankful to attendee, although there was a small disturbance, but it is a part and parcel of technology. I understand it. So I never blame. Unknowingly, many times it happens. But even then, I could complete my lecture. So thank you, thank you very much, thank you again. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for sharing your valuable uh, thoughts. First of all, I apologize for the interruption which you have faced during the lecture. So very sorry for that. And uh, now, this topic is open for discussion and query. So participants, you can on your mic and ask the question. Yes, any question? Because this is a very, very interesting topic. Not a question. of research is going on. Question, uh, Professor Deshmukh, not a question, but just a, just a comment. Actually, when I was doing uh, my postdoctoral fellowship in 1982-83 in Birmingham, then I had used the emulsification technique to emulsify the oils in the medium. And the, in the control also, I emulsified the contents. And the one control I took, which was not emulsified, and I found that the growth of the dermatophytes, fungi, it was more in the emulsified medium. And then in 1983-84, I was not having any explanation for that. When this nanotechnology came uh, came in the field, then I then I got the answer that during that time maybe that my ingredients of the nutrients uh, they get mixed up very well or their size was small, so the microbes were able to uh, able to uh, absorb them very easily and quickly without investing much of the energy. And uh, uh, thanks to the nano uh, technology or the nano biotechnology, or maybe that uh, in the coming years it will be the pico technology, femto technology, or uh, ato technology, or something like that. Because the molecules or the microbiology is the one of the fascinating, most fascinating branch. Thank you, Professor. Welcome, Professor Dubey. You are here. Uh, we all, uh, it is uh, nice to listen uh, the lecture, beautiful lecture of Professor Deshmukh. It was wonderful knowledge and addition uh, and a... Uh, thank and you, a sir. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank to you. see you on the screen. Welcome, Dubey, sir. Welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you. How are you? Fine? Yes, fine, fine. I'm happy to see you again. Thank you. Thank you. You know that uh, when I was in Gurkul Kangri recently, then I was hearing, uh, I, I saw that your history. But I think that the nanotechnology is known to the Vedic science since long, since thousands, thousand more than yeah, thousands. Yeah, yeah. Correct, correct, correct. Saran Bhasham, Saran Bhasham, it was used. This is the nanotechnology. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. You are yes. right. You are right. Dubey, sir, can focus more on the yes. historical yes. use of nanoparticles. Yes, he has written a wonderful book on the Vedic microbiology. <laughs> right. Correct. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, wonderful lecture, Professor Deshmukh. Thank you, thank you, sir.
sir i have one question uh, regarding this your presentation yes yeah you have told that nanoparticles can be directly used as uh, you know antimicrobial properties they carry correct so, so so those nanoparticles are loaded with any antimicrobial drugs or they can itself act as a antimicrobial resistance properties or you know inhibition properties like yeah in pune one company has produced a gel Mm -hmm. and they are combined with the another one okay but it can be used independently also okay no problem for use of independent use of these nano particles but some companies are mixing with the other one and they are getting good results dr kishor pakniker you might be knowing one of the very great a scientist from pune yes yes he has produced this gel and he got a patent on it but itself they can also be act yeah. as antimicrobial yes, yes, properties yes, yes yes so we have to prime boost those or we have to like you know you he explain that you prime the nanoparticles with agno3 and then it have those activities uh, like the antimicrobial resistance properties or i mean you got my point like we have to boost nanoparticles with some sort of no some microorganisms they have the ability to produce a nanoparticle only we have to give substrate to them okay so whenever we give a substrate they convert this metal into no no nano we have to optimize it okay. and after optimization we'll get the maximum yield of course at present again i will tell you mm -hmm. the chemical synthesis of nanoparticle gives more yield than biological yield. so we have to do more research on it and this topic is open for research nowadays thank you so okay. much sir thank you so much thank you Anyone else is uh, for question? Uh, hello, uh, I have one question. I said, Doctor Shubha Devi, uh, welcome you, sir. Uh, my question is, uh, am I audible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So my question is, uh, means uh, in nowadays we are talking about the sustainable approaches. for the development of the energy resources so what is the role of uh, nanotechnology uh, means bio nanotechnology especially the bio nanotechnology as we all are aware that there are so many types of like nano crystals which are using for the energy production in 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 terms of the solar uh, means foundation of those crystals in solar cells and all these things so how the bio nanotechnology is useful in the energy production bio nanotechnology i have not observed any application up to the time in energy production but as i told you as a superconductivity yes sir. and uh, many other physics and in material science they are used indirectly they might be used in energy but i have not got any reference up to the time for the energy production okay sir okay thank you okay, thank you sir thank you sir so uh, so many of the listeners are str still struggling uh, to know about the nanotechnology and it was such a easy presentation uh, to know to the na nanoparticles so thank you for such session uh, now i'm closing the topic for the for the discussion and moving towards the other uh, session thank you so much sir thank you thank you ma thank you sir so without consuming any time i would like to call upon professor ap gurg sir the well known name in the field of microbiology and biotechnology as he is the professor and founder head of microbiology department at ccs university merit professor ap gurg sir is having a huge pile of achievements from which i am listing some pavestones 
Professor Gurg has been worked as academician in University of Eston in Birmingham, in University of Liverpool in UK, in University of Edinburgh in Germany. Gurg sir has more than 150 national and international publications with supervision of 38 PhDs and 75 AMPHIL with 100 research projects. He has also worked as academic advisor of International Union of Microbiological Society. Sir has received grant from various societies for research such as Royal Society London, UNESCO, British Council, that DFG, British Mycological Society, and several other prestigious bodies. He addressed more than 200 chair sessions, keynote sessions, and various sessions broadcast on BBC London also. He is working as academician, uh, as academic advisor of various institutes, associated editor of reputed journals. Now, finally, after completing my struggle to summarize the golden journey of Professor A.P. Gurg, I'm inviting him to start his session on the interesting topic, biotechnology in 2050. So, sir, please start your session. Thank you, Dr. Garma. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, it is my pleasure to be on this international platform. And I know that uh, Professor Yogesh Mohan, he is known to me since last more than 20 years. I know his academic interests and his patronage. Deepa is also known to me. I have met her uh, on few occasions. She is a wonderful administrator. And I am happy to see that uh, my uh, co-worker, uh, Dr. Mukta, Dr. Ritu, Dr. Jackpal are here and uh, Professor Dube and Professor Deshmukh, we have already listened him on a wonderful topic of 2050, I will say it. So without wasting much more time about all these things, uh, I would like to introduce that how this biotechnology is going to change the life of the pupil and the life of the biosphere as a whole and the economy of the world in next 30 years. So okay, can I have a uh, screen share? Yes. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You can share now, sir. Share a screen directly from here. Yeah. No. Uh, first, I think that the, you you are all you are already sharing the screen, so it is okay. Okay. My screen share. Yes, sir. It is visible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, so let me introduce that how this biotechnology is going to change the world scenario in the next thirty years. You know that the biotechnology or microbiology or the modern science, they have gained the access to the public life during the last 50 years. That is after 1970. Before 70, this was a field of industrial technology or the materialistic science, or you can say of the several things. And when these materialistic science and the physical developments they have changed the world, they have changed the environment, they have changed the life, they have changed the economy. Then now the people are thinking for the sustainable life. That how we will sustain. The environment has been too much degraded by this physical, physical materialistic world. And now we are thinking about to move to the nature. Again, that is, if we go to the Vedic science or to the Vedic period of the uh, Vedic period of the development of the humanity and the society, then you will find that those days the people were loving the green nature and the economy and the balance between these. Now this biotechnology is going to make a balance between the life and all these things. So I'm trying to, uh, this, this slide is moving. My yes, slide is moving, moving, moving. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay, okay, fine. So the very simple thing that the what is biotechnology, if we just summarize this biotechnology, 
then I would like to say that the technological application of biological processes for making money. If any technique is not able to make money, it is not biotechnology. Very simple terms. So the money making process of the biological process is the biotechnology. Now, if we see that in 2050, we are going to have a population of 10 billion on this earth. And now this 10 billion population needs several changes, several changes in our lifestyle, several changes in our science. And what we are predicting in the next 30 years, there will exist a 56% of the food gap. There will exist a 593 million hectares of the land gap. And there will be an 11 gigatons of the greenhouse gas mitigation. These will be the three most important uh, problems which the world will face in the next three, uh, next three decades. And for all these three problems, the solution lies in biotechnology. I will now come one by one that how the biotechnology can change or how the biotechnology can solve these problems. UN in 2016, as you know, they have de uh, decided the 17 goals for the sustainable life. And the 17 goals are no poverty, zero hunger, good health, quality education, gender equality, clean water, sanitation, afforestation and clean energy, decent work, industry innovation, reduced inequalities, sustainable and responsible citizen climate action, the 17 goals. And now if you just see, you will find that all these 70 goals, for these 70 goals, what we need, where the biotechnology can work, the biotechnology can solve these eight problems or eight goals. The biotechnology can help in eradication of poverty. Biotechnology can help to reach the zero hunger. Biotechnology can give you a good health and the well-being. Biotechnology can provide you affordable and clean energy. It can also provide you the clean water and sanitation, and it can provide the industry innovation and the infrastructure, the climate change, and the life on land. So out of the 17 goals, you find that the biotechnology will play a pivotal role in solving or in achieving these eight goals, which have been set by the UN for the sustainable life in this biosphere. And the six major immediate transformations which are required and which are directly related to the biotechnology. These are human demography health, consumption of the end of food, decarbonization of the energy, and the food and biosphere, smart city development, and the digital revolution. These six are the immediate which are required to be solved. And India needs them desperately to solve and the biotechnology can solve these problems. Now, if you will see the nutrition, in the nutritional aspect, you will find that the two third of the population of the world is undernourished. Only one third people are able to get the balanced diet. And the two third population of the world is not able to get the sufficient quantity of the food or the sufficient quality of the food. And for both of these things, the biotechnology has the answer to solve. The biotechnology, you can say that this is the technology of the 21st century. And I have, I have tried to enumerate some of the things which will change this biosphere. We will, that is the greatest technology of the 21st century. It will mainly focus, we will focus in this century on the biological productivity management efficiency of crops, forest, and agriculture. And this is very important and necessary, keeping in view the climate change. Men and animal health, bioeconomy. This bioeconomy is going to make the quick change. And it will, it will because you know that nowadays, the economic war or the economic dominance is determining the power of the world in the bioeconomy, or rather to say the agro bioeconomy, 
is going to determine the future of the world is going to determine determine your mighty power in the world at the international level the dedicated bio, biomass microbial biodiversity, biodiversity it is the vast you know that about 99% of the viruses are still unknown 1.3 million viruses are supposed to be on this biosphere and out of that maximum number is unknown or even if you see in the prokaryotes and the eukaryotes you will find that the 90% of the microbes are not yet known and not only this professor dubey is uh, here professor deshmukh is, is here and many microbiologists are here they would agree with me that many of the microbes more than 80% of the microbes are still not culturable in the laboratory conditions even today so there is a huge huge opportunity for the microbiologists to survive in this earth and on this earth in the academic world rather to say and there is a huge opportunity to culture the, unless we culture the microbes we cannot exploit them for the biotechnological purpose now here i would like to emphasize that many of the people who are from the genetic engineering branch or from the dna uh, dna science or from the molecular science they say that we should know the gene composition of the organism no we should know the microorganisms their phenotypes there are phenotypic their morphology unless we know them personally how can we use them by technologically so so the microbial diversity is one of the most challenging field and most important aspect which is now going to be uh, going to shape a new turn the medical biotechnology as uh, professor deepa and professor deshmukh and uh, was uh, were saying in their inauguration remark that the gene editing yesterday i was reading that one of the cat has been uh, has been modified to the tune of our research organ culture tissue engineering organ transplant so many things you will find i will come over that the environmental biotechnology challenges to the club the climate change hydroponics and organic cultivation these are going to be the to, to change the change the world scenario in the next 30 years now i will come that six most important discovery of the biotechnology of the 21st century which have changed the entire scenario which have changed the entire thinking of the world the first and the biggest invention of the biotechnology is the biosensors now you see that the biosensors they are having the application in food analysis study of biomolecules and their interaction drug development climate detection medical diagnosis environmental field monitoring quality control industrial process control detection system for the biological warfare agents manufacturing of the pharmaceuticals and the replacement organs you know that the biosensors they will sense using the biological things i was reading uh, just uh, a few months ago that there will be a day you are using now these pen drives and uh, and these cds and all these things and these are uh, these are uh, that use a uh, huge waste material the plastic material and this plastic material you know that this is being dumped in the sea and uh, you must be aware that from the sea now this plastic material is coming into our food chain and through the food chain it is coming to our body and uh, I, i warn here many of the people those who are drinking this uh, this water from the from the plastic bottles you know that during in the plastic bottles now it has been detected that in the plastic bottle when the water is kept for a longer period water is the most important solvent it can dissolve and solve sol uh, and solve any of the any of the material uh, material in, in this world and these micro plastic or micro particles they can dissolve in the water and they can go into your body and in some of the some of the people the micro plastic or micro plastic molecules they have been detected in the blood this is very serious so the biosensors are going to change the biotechnology in the coming years which will sense which will analyze the food which will analyze the biomolecules which will do which will have a huge application in the biotechnology so the biosensor is the first 
most important discovery of the biotechnology. The second most important discovery, you know, is the bioprinting, which my uh, predecessors, uh, they were mentioning that how it is going to change, 3D bioprinting. Uh, this term, you know that now using this 3D bioprinting, bioprinting, you know that the printing, printing what you all understand. Bio, bio, and bioprinting that when we are going to use the biological material for printing, then it is the bioprinting. So it can use that tissue injury, transplantation, clinical treatment, drug screening, in toxicological research, cell culture, and all you will get know that in next 30 years, there will be no need of the donors for the organ transplant. The organs will be synthesized from your body using the tissue culture technique, using the animal cell culture technique, and the sense uh, and the organ will be synthesized, customized and this organ will be transplanted into your body and it has a huge, huge, huge potential, huge potential in the next 30 years. And the, bio, the medical science will flourish in that way that you will, you, you will find that the, uh, the biotechnology or the bioprinting will give you the answer uh, for in the medical science uh, for the several diseases and several things. Bioplastic is the another invention, great invention of the biotechnology of the 21st century. And you know that out of these 17 SDGs, which have been decided by the UN in 2016, you will find that 12.7 million tons of plastic enter the ocean each year, 12.7 million tons. And this 12.7 million tons of plastic, it takes years years to degrade in the ocean itself. Now, this is a most important thing that this accumulating toxic material in the ocean, it has now started entering into our body. And it has started creating the problems of several diseases in our body. And the bioplastic is the answer. The bioplastic it, you will find that the several of the product will be in the market and these products will be used. And by it is expected that by 2035, all the plastic will be eliminated from this world and the prior plastic will take its, uh, take, its, uh, take, take its share and the bioplastic will be used uh, in most of the daily uses. And it will change the scenario. The another thing is the polygenic embryo. This is the slide. Uh, it is the invention of the 22nd March, 2022. You know that now the scientists, they have been able to develop the techniques that they will be able to know the genetic composition of the embryo first day, one day old embryo. And this is the most important invention of the bio biotechnology. That is, when they will know the genetical composition of the one-day-old embryo, then they would know the gene kundali or the genetic composition, and they will predict that what type of disease this child will develop in the life. And these type of the genes can be replaced using this, I will come on that gene technology or the gene editing. Now, the bioenergy is the another gift of the 21st century, which will solve the environmental pollution. Bioenergy or green energy or the recycling energy, or you can say the cycling economics, cycle economics, it will change the world. You, you know that now the Reliance has decided to promote the green energy and the bioenergy at a large scale. And bioenergy, you know, that when Dr. Jackpal is uh, here, I am I, seeing him that he had joined. And Dr. Jackpal was uh, from my lab and who, uh, who started the work on the uh, cellulose degradation. And I remember that when he was uh, working, then we were uh, trying to find out, uh, find, find out the organisms which can uh, easily degrade 
the delignified cellulose. And he found uh, some of the strains of the glycladium dosium and some of the strains of the trichoderma. Uh, and uh, finally, we found that that the uh, enzyme beta glucosidase, the concentration of the beta glucosidase was less. And because of that, it was difficult to degrade the cellulose into the glucose. Because the conversion process from glucose to ethanol is well established. The only the conversion process, what we need to standardize, what we require to standardize, or what we require to optimize, uh, it was to the conversion of the cellulose to the 50% of the material or the lignocellulose or the green material on this earth or the biomass, green biomass on this earth, it is composed of the cellulose, 50%, almost 50%. Now, if this 50% of the biomass, it is converted into the glucose, then the glucose to ethanol technology is well developed. And the ethanol is one of the most important bioenergy source. Although there are the biofuel there, the, the, the algae can be used, cyanobacteria can be used, and uh, several uh, angiospermic plants can be used. Several things now are being, uh, uh, being investigated. And this bioenergy, it is going to change the scenario because you know that the fossil fuel based energy, it is increasing the carbon level of the air. And the number of the deaths per year are greater because of pollution in comparison to the COVID-19, which we have all witnessed. These are the silent deaths, you can say. Silent deaths due to the pollution, increasing pollution. You know that the gene which has been identified, the human genome has been completely identified, and this human genome is worth for living for 120 to 150 years. And if we are living for less than that, then there are something missing in our lifestyle or something missing in our food or something missing in our environment. And the green energy or the bioenergy is going to change the scenario in these next 30 years. And it will change the bioeconomy of the world itself. Gene editing, I'm coming over there. That is the CRISPR or uh, now the... Uh, CAS9 and CAS12, these are the two genes which can be uh, changed. And now one, th one thing very important, the sequencing of the human genome, which was earlier at the cost of $95 million, it has now dropped down to $950. $950. And now the question is that when this $950 will also come down to, to some $200 or $300, then the, everyone will go for the gene kundali. Until now, you are going to the Pandaji and you are asking them to prepare an astronomical kundali that at what year the person will get this, this, this. If you see, then you will find the, these all things from our Vedic science. Astronomy is also having a very strong sound footing of the science. And this astronomy, if it is rightly applied, rightly used, rightly interpreted, and instead of this Kundali or the Jan Kundali, the time will when you will get the Jin Kundali. And the pupil will be able to know that what type of disease will be developed in the next 10 years or next 20 years. And you can also get the gene editing and you can save from these genetically inherited diseases. For example, this diabetes is considered or it, it is now known that it is due to the genetical composition. It is hereditary. And now the pupil will be able to overcome it by gene manipulation. Or there will be a time when you will find the, the designer babies, designer babies, you know that, that uh, I remember the one of the uh, very beautiful story when uh, Winston Churchill was the prime minister. Uh, you know that uh, his face was not very, uh, very beautiful or it was, he, he, he was having a very ugly face, ugly face you can see. So one beautiful lady went to him 
and said that I would like to marry you because our children will be intelligent like you and beautiful like me. And then Winston Churchill replied that if it, if it reverse, then what will happen? So the, the lady lady came out. So now the now the answer is that the gene editing, the gene editing will be able to, because we have been able to identify that what are the genes of the intelligence, what are the genes of the energy, what are the genes of the, the complete human genome has been sequenced. And we know that each and we know the function of each and every genes. So now the desired genes will be transferred by gene editing, by CRISPR technology. And now this patent has already, already been granted uh, just last week. And now again, the controversy on this patent has, because they, there were the two groups who were fighting for this patent uh, since last uh, more than four or five years. And now the, uh, now the international uh, community decided the patent in, uh, in favor of the one, but the other has gone to the court. So that is a, another question that is why this is not still coming to the market, but I predict that in the next 10 years, this gene editing technology will be highly commercialized process by the, uh, by the industries. And you will be able to get your gene Kundali. You will be able to know that which type of the disease your baby is likely to, uh, li likely to have in the future and how you can control them or how you can have the babies of your choice. So that, that is the, the, the biotechnology is going to do. Now, we, this is another one very important thing, the virtual and the augmenting reality is the sixth invention. Although it is not have the directly related to the biotechnology, but you know that the biotechnology people, they are clever enough, like the botanist. So they have, they have uh, borrowed this technology of the computer science. And the computer science people, uh, now you, you know that on uh, 6th of the, the March, I think, uh, or yes, 6th of the March or 6th, of the February, there, there was a uh, there was a wedding, virtual, uh, virtually augmented uh, reality wedding. There will be a thing that now the biotechnology will such a take such a shape that you will bear such type of the goggles and some some sort of type of the uh, gloves, and uh, using this biotechnology and the computer mixed system. You will be able to able to see the entire entire body from the inside, and you will be able to know that what are the composition where the cells are defective, where the cells are doing uh, doing what they are doing. So you can see the internal internal things without uh, without making the surgery. You know that the uh, uh, that the uh, um, in the <laughs> micro microscopy also some of the things uh, which can be used now. The, uh, I'm coming now to the, the, these are the six most important uh, def, uh, inventions of the biotechnology which are going to change the world. So the first effect, what we, we are going to witness, now I'm coming on that. These were the six most, the carbon emission can be reduced within the biotechnology because the carbon emission, you know, that this is one of the most important problem of present day industrial processes. The industrialization during the last 50 years, it has gifted, it has poisoned our air. And now it is the duty of the biotechnologies to make it purified. And for that, the biotechnology inventions will play a great role. India alone produces the 350 million tons of the agricultural waste. Any, any comment or anything, something from, from some audience? And this, 350 million tons of the agriculture waste, if it is converted by using the biorefinery and the biotechnological process, then you will find that the much of the problem can of the bioenergy and the green energy can be solved and even the biomass and the several uh, utilizable products, chemicals, biomolecules, animal feeds, ethanol, chemicals, they can be prepared. The biotechnology based sustainable smart cities. This is the future of the city that you will find such type of the it's, you know that uh, i'm the sectional president of the environmental science of the indian science congress also so it is my duty to apprise and to to, to to tell the people that that unless we have a sustainable smart cities sustainable development then 
there is no definition. The, the definition of the smart cities, what was given uh, by the engineers in the last uh, few, uh, few years, that is not sustainable. The sustainable will be only when everything can be recycled, cycle in a, cycling in the economy, which is, not, which is not evolving any toxic things. So the major causes of the another I am coming that the soil, soils are now being deficient. And these soils are eroded. You can say the fertility of the soil is eroded. Punjab and Haryana have lost their fertility of the soil and the UP is the next. And this can be revived using the biotechnology, using the microbially controlled uh, control uh, system. The biotechnology can impact the soil carbon sequestration also. Because you know that the most of the carbon, we are talking, many of the people are talking of the nitrogen, but they are not talking of the carbon, which is also very important for the soils. And the carbon profiling of the soils of the India, it has been done and it has been found that due to the change or due to the, due to the change of the diversity of the microbes, and particularly the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the mycorrhizal fungi, this carbon level of the soil is being de depleted. So that type of the technology will come and that type of the technology is the answer for this uh, carbon sequestration of the soils. And for the re to regain the soil fertility, biotechnology is the answer. Biotechnology can only provide the solution for the, uh, for, for the soil fertility. Now the population, you know that by 2050, we are expecting that the 10 billion will be the population. And this is the yearly change. And the biotechnology can only give you the solution. The applications, you can say the green biotechnology, red biotechnology, blue biotechnology, and white biotechnology. These are the, these are the terms which have been used. The red biotechnology for the medical biotechnology, blue biotechnology for the aquatic fish, and the marine, marine system. White biotechnology, that is the milk and the microbial processes, organic and the inorganic or inorganic molecules, all these, all these four things, they cover the entire world, they cover the entire bioeconomy. And these are under the category of the biotechnological applications. Now I am coming because uh, Professor Deshmukh was saying that the microbiology is one of the uh, most important things. So I, I will say that I used to say that microbes are gone. If you see that the originator of life, from where the life originated, originated from the microbes. Our ancestors are microbes. If you see the origin of the life, you will find and you will know that the prokaryotes. So the Brahma, microbes are Brahma. Vishnu is for the sustainability of the life. Microbes can provide you food, shelter, clothes, air, all living material for happiness of the life. So they are the Vishnu. Mahesh, destroyer of life. You have already seen in COVID-19, microbes can also destroy. Don't disturb them. Don't underestimate the power of microbes. Microbes are Durga, goddess of power. You know that the mitochondria, which is also a part of the microbe because the microbe or mitochondria, they develop first and these are the powerhouse of the cells. Saraswati, the goddess of intelligence and the genes of intelligentsia, they are also known to be located on the site of plasma of the mother. And therefore, you can see and you will find that the microbes are gone. And microbiology is the mother of life sciences. You know that. I have deliberately chosen the word mother, not the father, because most of the things or most of the people, they they designate that the father of microbiology, father of biology, or father of the biotechnology, or father of this, 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 this. But you know that the mother contributes the maximum. Mother contributes the maximum. Mother is the generator. So that is why I have used the word microbiology is the mother of life science. And you saw, you see that life science, what includes botany, zoology, microbiology, cell biology, molecular biology, everything. And these everything in may say, if you just remove microbiology, then you will find zero. Biotechnology minus microbiology, you can decide yourself. In my opinion, it's zero. So the microbiology is the mother of the life science. 
use of the modern technology for the sustainable India. This is the requirement and you will find that uh, the biotechnology has the answer. I think that I am running out of the time, so I will go quick. So to increase the farmer's income, again, you will find that the biotechnology has an answer and you will find that we have calculated that the farmer's net income, how it can be, it should be decided, it should be decided production into price minus cost of cultivation. And then this should be the farmer's net income. But if you will find that the most of the people, they are not able to get the right price of their, uh, their product. And that is why we have seen that the biotechnology will shift the challenges of the reduced water quantity before the farmers and the, uh, and the biotechnology can change the, uh, change the scenario. Climate is smart crop system. Again, the biotechnology has the answer because the climate change you are finding and, it, it, and the farmer doesn't know that what will be the climate uh, in the month of June or, Jan or July this year. And that is why the entire, entire community, so the, we need the exact answer and these answers are lies in the biotech. Major microbial commercial biofertilizers, you know that these are the phospho, rhizo, azoto, trichoderma. So these will change and these will take the shape of the bioeconomy and the industries will start producing these. So the biotechnology will take a huge shape. Those students who are joining this lecture or who are present in this uh, seminar, they should not only focus on finding the job, they should focus on finding the entrepreneurship. They should focus on the formulation of the biofertilizers, biopesticides. This is a huge scope, huge scope in the science. Several biofertilizers, they are already in the market, Indian market, and cyanobacteria are going to make a big, big challenge for the biofertilizer industry. And they will make a huge, huge demand in the coming 30 years. And without using the cyanobacteria, it will be difficult to trap the nitrogen of the air. And commercial uses of the algae, they are already known. So the entrepreneurs will develop in the next 30 years, which will synthesize, which will form the algae, cyanobacteria, biofertilizers, biopesticides, and biocontrol agents. And these biocontrol agents and biopesticides will be able to provide you the organic food and these are necessary, Bacil, Bacillus thuringiensis is one of them. There are several ones, Trichoderma is another one. Commercial biopesticides, they are already in the market. Bioeconomy for the mineral industry, this, will, this is going to make a to change. Because you know that the microbes, they are the indicators. They are the bioindicators, you can say. And using the microbes, you can extract, and you can extract uh, the minerals from the soil, even the uranium, even the gold, even the platinum, even the, 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 the huge cost materials from the soil, you can extract them using the microbes. So this is going to change uh, in 2050. The bioeconomy of the microbial mining, you will find that it's going to, uh, to go in a big way in India and abroad. And the bioeconomy of the butanol and the bioethanol, these are going to be the two most important components in the next 30 years, the bioethanol and the biobutanol. Cyanobacteria, food fertilizer, cyanobacteria also for the food and, and the algal oil production, the biofuel, bioethanol or bio, biofuel, you can say it's not by the biofuel, the algal oil production, you will find that this is going to make a change. Spirulana, the single cell proteins, the micro edible microbes, algae, bacteria, yeast, and several things you will find, they will take the shape of the industry. Bioeconomy, antibiotics, antimicrobials, they will also be produced during the next 30 years. And you will find the huge industries. You know that the China, the, how the China developed during the last 30 years. If you see the history of the economy of the China, you will find only after 99. Thank you, Jagpal, joining the thing. I was, I was talking just a few minutes ago about uh, about your Jackpal, yep. uh, I, I was just talking about you uh, before few minutes that how the bioenergy or the green energy will change the cellulose production, cellulose into the glucose will change the scenario. And at that time we were thinking that it is not going to be a viable process, 
but now the reliance and the several other industries they are going to come uh, in the long way in that uh, particular process the bioeconomy lactococcal products they will also uh, make a sense and the several industries are going to come in the entrepreneurs in the next uh, few years and the microbial applications you know that this is the historical things i will uh, go quickly the systemic is the first systemic application of microbiology if you see that is a fermentation ethanolic fermentation biotechnological production food beverage enzyme technology metabolites biotechnological production in 19 uh, in 2050 the biological fuel generation environmental biotechnology agriculture biotechnology diagnostic tools these will be the major applications ethanol production using the high strains now at present the strains what we are having in india they are able to tolerate only up to the 11% of the ethanol so the now the Uh, there is a challenge to the young scientists or the young entrepreneurs who are listening my lecture that they should focus on such type of the strains that if you, even if you are able to uh, able to improve the strains for one percent or two percent, then it will make a huge change because now the some of the strains uh, they are uh, coming uh, they they are coming and they are being investigated which are able to tolerate. the 15 16 or 17% of the ethanol and this is the one of the most challenging field uh, for the fermentation industry the typical carbon dry grain ethanol uh, plant i have given you this this is the uh, the uh, biomass uh, production uh, system which will come uh, in the long way uh, the vinegar will be the another product which will be used and which will be the industry of this vinegar will be developed in next 30 years to a huge thing because the vinegar you know this is having the many of the things this is very good for the gut microbiome in my research laboratory in the sobit institute of engineering and technology one of the student uh, jotsna uh, she is doing the work and we have been able to find that some of the vegetables if they are treated with the vinegar and they are used the uh, vinegar treated vegetables they are able to give the good gut microbiota in the microbiota is going to make it make a huge change huge sense in the next 30 years for the control of your disease aap aap jante hain na ke jaisa ann waisa man aur jaisa piyoge pani waisi rahegi vaani so hamari jo vedic science hai vedic science mein so that is why ke jaisa aap khana khaoge waisa aapka pet rahega waisa aapka digestion rahega aur jaisa aapka pet rahega waisa aap sochoge because now the scientists they have been able to demonstrate that the signals not directly go from the brain but the signals from the stomach go to the brain and then the entire body is controlled so the gut microbiota is going to make a big sense and the gut microbiota it will be uh, the the food industry will witness and the biomolecules the citric acid organic acids food grade acetic acid they will all be the product of the biotechnology and they will change the scenario in the next 30 years some of the organic acids i have given you this list the this microbiology again you will find that the, without microbiology the biotechnology cannot go the biotechnology is entirely dependent upon the microbiology microbial fermentation of the milk and the biotechnological use microbial proteins biomass will be the another uh, great uh, challenging field which will give you the high protein content vitamins because you know that the poverty or the or the or, or the Or, or you can say that balanced diet balanced diet can be provided because it is expected that in the next 30 years the size of the agricultural land cultivable land it will be reduced and the agricultural production will go down or you know at that even now the time the when the agriculture production is rising then the quality of the nutrients of the agriculture produce is going down and to supplement this quality of the products sir you will have to depend upon the microbial proteins biomass and the biotechnology is the answer biotechnical products already in the market the fungal biomass this is going to make a big challenge in the industrial process because you know that the industries they are giving the huge huge effluents the polluting they are polluting the entire entire earth entire biosphere and for that the fungi they can be used as a filtration organism as the biofilters the commercial production of the primary and the secondary microbial metabolites again using the biotechnology amino acids again you will find that the customized food health 
the, 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 there will be a day when when uh, when the uh, when the industry will produce the customized food for the children for the child for the for the special child or for the special uh, old age people uh, if they are suffering from the alzheimer disease if they are suffering from the lung disease if they are suffering from any disease then the certain type of the customized foods will be prepared for them citric acid is going to make a big uh, change production of antibiotics as it has been already enumerated by my colleague uh, professor deshmukh and antibiotics antimicrobials production of various microbial enzymes you will know that this is bio enzymes or bio uh, biotechnology bioeconomy will it will change the scenario microbial enzymes microbial enzyme applications in 2050 the huge number of the uh, uh, products and huge things will be in the market chemolithotropes will be the again which will the mineral technology mineral mining butanol this is the duplication of the slide sorry 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 so this is the now the, the gut microbiome this is the now the recent uh, information you will find that now the pupil was thinking that everything goes from the brain you no know, now this gut microbiome it sends a signal to the brain and then the brain control so you have to focus on the gut microbiome and the gut microbiome is directly under the control of the food quality of the food jaisa khaoge an waisa rahega man so the gut microbiome is also responsible for your immunity 70% of the immunity by the gut microbiome and you see that the several gut uh, we have uh, we are also working over here that the dominant bacterial species is that if you are having some depression or if some person is having the having the mental problems then using the microbes using by giving the gut microbiome or by making making him uh, his gut microbiome that is the uh, uh, bifidobacterium bifidobacterium this is considered as a happy bacteria so if the population of the bacteria high bifidobacterium can be increased in your gut then you will feel happy you will feel smiling so the microbiology of the gut microbiome is going to make a big change in the change this is the uh, 2019 discovery that the fecal bacterium and coprococcus these are the two butyrate prostate producing organisms and if they are given to the uh, to the pupil who are suffering from the depression or who are suffering from the some uh, some sort of unhappiness if these uh, bacteria are given to them then they will feel happy so lactic acid bacteria are the probiotics you know that these are the also going to make a big sense lactococcal products this is the grass generally regarded as safe these microorganisms and the major achievements in the last 50 years you will find the last 50 years the major achievement is that we have life expectancy it has increased but our next 30 years is that life expectancy should increase to 120 to 150 years you will uh, you, you, you many of you will laugh on me that how it will be possible yes it will be possible i will live here for 30 years more and then you will find that the microbiology and biotechnology will contribute in a great way and the life of the people will increase will further increase and it will be close to the uh, close to the expectation of the gene health for all no poverty these are the expected things in the next 30 years which we are going to get electric car for everyone and all this the biotechnological scenario in india amongst the top 20 biotechnological destination in the world india third in asia pacific we are at 12 position in the world and third in the asia pacific industry valued 963 billion dollars in 2019 and it is expected that by 2025 it will increase to 150 billion dollars by 2025 indian technology industry in the global market is expected to 19% increase while by 2017 uh, uh, it was 3% increase now the big change and the five sectors which will witness the growth in india biopharmaceuticals bioservices bioagri bio industry and bio it these are expected that this will be the scenario in the next 30 years in india 
in you will find that the maximum jobs you will find in the biotechnology computer machine learning robotics data analysis analytics these will be the good these are the advantages of the biotechnology department of biotechnology from this i uh, borrowed this this is the main aim mission of the department of biotechnology of india and these are the skill capital these are our advantages we are having the infrastructure we are having the policy support epidemiological factors and diet will control the microbial populations and microbes will control your health habits and environment agriculture ayurveda and yoga will dominate in 2050 and thanks for listening and this will be the food in 2050 balanced food and it will make you happy like this this is the prediction or so thank you very much thanks for giving me an opportunity to be present on this platform and the great platform and i am happy that many of my colleagues many of my coworkers are associated with this conference so best of luck for the conference and thanks to the organizers for giving me an opportunity to interact with the galaxy of the scientists and the participants over this platform thank you very much thank you thank you so much sir thanks for sharing your views on such an interesting yes, Dekpal, topic I, I was dipal i was referring you during my lecture that when you were doing the phd on the ligno carbohydrates then you were asking me that uh, is it going to have any future and now you will find that the green energy the conversion of the ligno carbohydrates to the glucose and then to the uh, to the ethanol it is going to come that true jaypal was uh, uh, doing the phd with me long back uh, for 30 years and at that time we were having the so many because in 1989 where it was a dream when trichoderma risai was uh, was invent, uh, invented and uh, many of the people were having uh, having that it, it will it has no future and jackpal was also having the doubt at that time but now i think that you will be happy to know that now the world is recognizing the bioenergy and the green energy and the 50% of the biomass is going to be converted to the green energy very soon in the next 30 years thanks jackpal joining uh, this platform thanks thank you sir thank you sir thank you so much uh, now i am now i am opening the session for discussion and query uh, so participants can uh, on their mic and ask the questions and discuss with us sir okay yes any comments or queries if people are shy or if people are hesitating you can mail me your queries and then i will try to answer them because many times you know that uh, youngsters they they get hesitate to ask the questions or to clarify the points but this is the wonderful platform where uh, you can interact dr shalini is also here or not I was seeing Sonima Agniyotri. Yes, sir. Doctor Shalini yeah. will present tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. We see. Will be tomorrow. Okay. I will try. Doctor Sonima Agniyotri. She will also present tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. So, anyone here uh, for the discussion on the topic? Right. No, no questions. No discussion. It means that everything has gone. Someone over. is raising. <laughs> uh, I am again asking. If someone is here for uh, discussion and queries, oh, Doctor Animesh is asking something for you, sir. Is it raining? Good morning, sir. Very good morning. Very good morning. Uh, yeah, sir, it was a very nice presentation. But I, uh, I have one question to you. Yeah. Like that, you are. discuss about uh, like gene editing tools and uh, designer babies yes. and you know um, uh, organ culture yes. something so I, i want to know like uh, what is your views like if those technologies came into application 
like if we can design the babies and you also talk about gene kundli so if we go to a doctor and we scan our dna and we know that it is these genes are defective and we can yeah. replace these genes so what is what is the pros and cons of this applications into the human you have put a very controversial question <laughs> yeah it is having the ethical issues yeah it has it has so much of ethical issues that actually the committee has not still cleared it Yes, yes, and that is why many of these uh, technologies are not still commercialized. Yes, 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 yes. But as far as the science is concerned, as far as the technology is concerned, this is well known. Yeah, because and, because medical science is revolutionized. Yes, yes, yes. We are moving forward into the technology. Yes, yes. But the thing is that whether those things should be come into existence or not, that is a question mark actually. Title of my lecture was biotechnology in 2050. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My my title of the lecture was not biotechnology today. No, no, no. I understand, oh, sir. But my question next, was related to that. Years, in next thirty years, the mm-hmm. pupil will be mature enough mm-hmm. that these profess these ethical issues will be sorted out. Yes. Who who thought who thought that uh, that that this we will be able to talk like this. Yes. And when this technology came, then there were again the several professional ethics, uh, ethics issues and so on, so on things. So the pupil of the world, civilization of the world, it will grow. It will become mature. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. And we will think positive. And and you know that even after thinking positive, negative cannot be ruled out. Yes, definitely. So the so the so the science will think. Science will think. Scientists will think that whatever is. whatever is better or whatever is more good for the society yes. and the scientist <coughs> will become mature enough or some regulations will come now you know that the artificial intelligence or this uh, or this uh, car without driver again yes. there is at this time you are thinking that how it is possible but in next 10 years it will be possible it will be possible because because the technology will develop now you know that the gene kundli yes this is possible scientifically so that is why my my title of the topic my title of the lecture biotechnology in 2050 in next 30 years what you can visualize what will happen you you think that the biotechnology will give the answer to every problems everything most of the things it is having the brightest future bio economy or rather to say agro bio economy will dominate the world not this war warfare economy which is now being fought between the ukraine and russia yes. the people will now now you see that the ukraine and russia they have been left alone you are you thinking that the world war will happen no world war will not happen it will not go because because you know the atomic power i i, I must say from this great plat- platform that uh, the great vision of madam indira gandhi and atal bihari vajpayee ji both they kept india as neutral and they stick to the atomic power if you remember uh, of my age then at that time there were so many sanctions so many things but we did not yield to the international pressure and we continue to uh, on the atomic power and now today we are the atomic power so many of the some of the people may fight with us but we will not go on the on the extinction war because they will they know that we are having the atomic power ukraine did the blunder in 1990s when they destroyed their atomic weapons if they would not have destroyed their weapons then they would not have been facing this situation now so the who thinks in in 2050 what will happen the 2050 will be the this century is the century for the biotechnology for the computer science for artificial intelligence for the data science for the, yes, the big big things yes sir this is the application science application part thank you so much
Thank you, sir. So when we displayed your topic by technology 2050 to uh, the session, our uh, PG students were uh, asking, is that possible the lecture on by technology 2050? So your lecture is live now. I think they are very much benefited by our thoughts and the presentation. And they will come to know that it is possible. <laughs> it is possible. Yes, yes, it will happen. It will happen. I have no doubt. Definitely. Sir. I, because these are, this is no, no hypothesis. No hypothesis. Every technique what I have mentioned over here, these are known. Their applied aspects are known. Their applications are known. Only their commercialization is not still to the public because of the, their viability, because of the accepted, acceptability hindrance by the society. But, but this is known. Every, every technique what I have mentioned, yes, sir. everything is known. And it is well established, safe, safe technology. And the time, you know that maybe I'm talking of 2050, maybe that it will achieve in 2035. Definitely. Yes. Science is going so fast. Okay. Thank you, sir. We are delighted with your expertise and knowledge in every way possible. So without you, consuming so much time, I would like to tell you about our next keynote speaker. Uh, sir, because of urgent piece of work, Dr. Dubey is not with us for today's presentation. He will join us uh, tomorrow for the keynote session. So uh, for this time, I'm inviting uh, Dr. Jagpal Singh, sir, uh, for the session. Dr. Jagpal Singh, sir, is principal scientist currently working on microbial diagnostic essay, development, nutritional and microbiology subjects matter expert for dietary supplements and nutritional products development in Los Angeles, USA. Sir is principal scientist, Farmative LLC, Los Angeles, California, USA. He is leading organization for microbiology regulatory experiences established by FDA, NSF, and USP. Dr. Singh has done his postdoctorate in clinical microbiology from Germany. He has also worked in field of antimicrobial drug resistance mechanism and development of novel microbial diagnostic assays. He has approximately 50 publications in index journals and several conferences and symposia. In spite of a heavy busy schedule and time reference, Dr. Jakpal Singh sir is here to, to look out his valuable time and joined us today to be a part of this conference with the topic, Microbiology Quality Management Program and Regulation. So sir, please, I welcome you for the session. Sir, please, uh, on your mic. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Jakpal, unmute your mic. Sir, you know, uh, sir, you are in mute phase. We are unable to hear you. Uh, can you hear me now, Dr. Gurima? Yes, sir. We can hear. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. But it, it's still your you. mic so in mute. How you are able to deliver? I would like like to know this technology. Sir, actually, I have. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm working on my phone as well as I borrow one laptop. I'm here in India due to some emergency issues. And therefore, like I'm using two two devices. Therefore, I okay. I, okay. 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 Sir. Now, I, I now was also surprised. <laughs> Great. Okay. And it's saying me host disabled participant screen sharing. Can you allow me to Just a minute, share my sir. screen? Uh, uh, Dr. Shubha Devedi, ma'am, please allow already, 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 you are allowed now. Uh, you can check your screen. You can check your screen once. Uh, I'm checking it, it's not. Okay. I don't know, maybe, I, I, as I mentioned, I have two devices and I'm not sure actually, uh, which right one you... Now, yeah, actually, right now you are allowed in Singh Shalini's iPhone. No, no, other one. No, sir. No, ma'am. Uh, actually, it is not visible. The other one is not visible to me right now. 
Okay. Yes. Yes, sir. We can see your screen, sir. Okay. Sir. Okay, sir. Welcome, sir. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for keeping patience with me. And I know, like, it was quite complicated for me because I'm not having all my stuff here. So it took a little bit time. And I would like to thank uh, Professor Garg because he is my mentor. He is my doctor father, and I. Where I am today, I would not be without him. My colleague, in when I was doing my PhD, Mukta was there in the lab as well. So, and she invited me for this conference. So it's a great pleasure to speak about quality management system and regulation. So this is not like a typical science, but how the science works. in uh, when we transfer the science into the real world the research so i'm going to discuss today uh, <clears throat> about that so uh, first of all i i would like to discuss like what is quality management program because quality management program is a program where which needs to be developed by every lab either either it is a research lab or it is a clinical lab or it is a industrial microbiology lab without these uh, without this program it is not possible to get quite quality results as well as we cannot like succeed whatever we are doing and our research just would be limited to the lab we cannot transfer into real real world without that program so this program is very imp important and why it is important without a lab uh, laboratory quality program we make too many mistakes when we make mistakes we repeat it several times and when we repeat the experiment several times it make analysis very costly and um, with the uh, mistakes what what happens sometime we make wrong decision based on the wrong results so that is very like uh, where we need to focus more and we have to uh, develop the technique where we can improve that and we can improve all these things by using the uh, quality management program and always uh, when it comes to the expenses they co caused by wrong decisions always like if we are having the right decisions right planning so our expenses is going to be less repeating analysis of samples will make it more expensive investigation of problem once we are started by investigating any problem so it will take lot of time which, which will cost us money as well revising the procedure when we are going to we will find out that our procedure is not right so what we will do we will have to go on the next level and we have to re uh, revise all the procedures and it will cost us uh, money as well and uh, most important thing for any laboratory if we are making wrong decisions and uh, producing false results so that will uh, we are going to lose our good reputations so quality management system is uh, <clears throat> a laboratory quality management system is a collection of process on consi consistently producing the high quality results 
so we uh, like uh, in this uh, when we implement this system so we are going to focus more uh, like uh, to producing high quality results and how we can achieve that uh, i will tell you in the next few slides and what a quality management system can del deliver connects every department in each phase of testing like if we are having like two or three labs involved or multiple departments are involved so we can collaborate and we can connect during the, through this quality management and we can improve our process very effectively <clears throat> And next is um, we get a positive feedback from the collaborative environments that's uh, <clears throat> throughout the testing. So we can uh, have like more uh, improved diagnostic test or whatever test we are developing. <clears throat> then other uh, benefit is like we can proactively proactively respond to internal and external risk if there is any trends we are looking so we can find out from where these are these risks are coming so we can see like if it is coming from the internal or outside outside like we get a lot of materials from outside for testing so we can like analyze those risks and we can proactively respond for that So uh, I would like to describe in this slide a little bit how the quality management system works. So in this slide, you see that like uh, I try to distribute it in uh, three different standards. Like one is the main is the pillars where uh, what are the main pillars for a laboratory which should be then it's come to the blocks, what are the main blocks, and then the what standards we are going to follow through those. <laughs> so main pillars uh, in this uh, like quality management systems is uh, the first is the quality itself. Second is the facility, what facility we are having, uh, what we are having in that and what we can achieve, what materials we are having in that facility. That's very important pillars as well. If we are not having good materials or good, good equipment, so then it is not going to work at all. Then third is the reagents itself, like what uh, for reagents which we are, we are using for analysis. Fourth is the supply. Do we have the supply, like uh, our supply chain should not be uh, disrupted at any time. If we are developing a high quality result, so, uh, so the supply is very important here. And other important factor is a laboratory. Laboratory like, uh, what is the laboratory set setup? Who is in the laboratory quality management? Who is managing the laboratory? Um, what is the work distribution? How we are doing all the audit? So it's, uh, so laboratory is very important. Other important factor is, uh, IT systems in the laboratory because if we are using uh, the I nowadays the science is so advanced as Professor Garg already mentioned like uh, how it's working so it's uh, and how we are achieving a lot of high technology <clears throat> research is coming in so IT system is very important in each and every uh, laboratory now in high through uh, through output uh, laboratory you can. Uh, transfer all the results without going on paper or anything, you can directly transfer into the laboratory information management system, which is a web-based program where uh, like nobody can manipulate, nobody can do this. So that's very important. Then uh, a storehouse like uh, a storehouse in laboratory, if we are talking like me, I'm thinking, talking mostly here for, for the uh, laboratories. So, in laboratory, storehouse is like how we are storing our media, where we have to store, what are the important stuff, like where we are going to put, like some some are very sensitive, like some reagents, so we are we storing that, are we maintaining that, like uh, temperature or humidity. So these are very important uh, things as well. And last and not least pillar is the data integrity. Data integrity is very important because 
the, if uh, if an auditor is auditing your laboratory and they say any suspect, so they um, so they go through all each and every data. And I I recently was involved in FDA audit, so I know that it's very important. So that's the pillar. So these are the main pillars. Then uh, the blocks comes the management quality reviews how we like uh, reuse all the quality systems in the lab the man that's the job of management is everything is uh, working on what is uh, uh, other uh, important function of what is the role of quality control units like how it's working in the lab like what is the ro role of an analyst what is the role of supervisor manager what is the role of director so it's everything like uh, they, these must be well defined role otherwise it would be very difficult like if we are not having the defined role so then we are going to uh, struggle a lot in the lab and uh, then it starts like everybody oh it's not my role but it's his role so that's we should avoid those this type of thing so that will impact your uh, overall stuff as well so if you are having that well determined role so that can like uh, limit those type of uh, disputes in the lab within uh, like uh, uh, laboratory staff. <clears throat> Other uh, very important stuff is like you are changing a, any process or anything in the lab or any method or any step in the method or any reagent. So how competent you are like you are where you are documenting all those change controls and what steps you are taking for those change controls so that is very important step as well in the lab so each and every step what you like if you'd make it any change did you do all the background work did you do <laughs> completed all the regulatory works which i'm going to what requires the regulatory work in a coming few slides i will uh, discuss about that then again is like uh, the complaints like if we are having some complaints from outside our customers you are our customers how we are handling those com complaints that is very important and not on handling like uh, uh, based on those uh, complaints, how we are improving our overall diagnostic or our uh, overall laboratory process. So that's very important as well. So we are we taking any corrective action? So that's very important. Next is non-compliant <coughs> report, how we are handling these non-conformance uh, non report. So that is very, uh, uh, very important factor as well. Uh, NCRs, like how we are going to handle those NCRs. And next is a result re release. If we are releasing a results, how we, it is going through our uh, the quality management reviewing. So, so if there is a manager, he's reviewing or a director is reviewing before releasing the, or do we have a system releasing the report? Because this is very important aspects as well. If one analyst, uh, done the work other anal analyst is reviewing as well so this review the process before is a release is very important aspect next thing it comes like good laboratory trainings good laboratory trainings is uh, like how we are following the uh, laboratory practice so that is very important as well so we have to always follow the like trained our staff for the good laboratory practice and not only staff, even management should follow those practice as well. Document control, uh, do we have effective document control? Are we having uh, the document controls? And uh, I, I got my postdoctoral training from Germany and I know how Germans work. Like if you will ask like maybe 20 years old document, they can pull that within like, less than one minute so they are having that document control system developed in all over germany in the labs that's like uh, amazing i work in japanese as well like in collaboration because uh, the company right now i am working is owned by a, a japanese pharmaceutical which is known as Otsuka pharmaceuticals so i work very closely with some of the japanese scientists so i know like 
Why, what is the importance of document control and uh, how they are controlling? So the document control is an important aspect and we have to control each and every and document in each and every uh, step in the process and we have to keep that in a safe place. Next step is validation. Like if we are developing a method, like uh, we have to prove like our method is well validated and this validation like uh, it can go into any lab and it will work in the same way. So validation, method validation is a very important aspect. Then um, next uh, is self in self infection. The self self infection inspection is <clears throat> when we talk about the self infection, like we have to inspect ourselves, how we are doing, how we are performing, and this within the laboratory, each and every member or the laboratory itself inspect like how we are doing and how we can improve. So that is very important aspect for improving the results next come is the performance quality report so how we are doing those quality reports are we following all the all these important aspects in those quality reports or we are just putting some notes and we are saying that oh, this is the quality report no we have to be very concise very clear and truthful and honest for any like when we are developing any quality reports. So that's very important as well. And uh, other one comes the regulatory audit st status, like uh, there are so many regulatory bodies. I'm not sure if regulatory bodies comes here in India and what is the status now. But in US, if you are having even a small lab, you cannot run without like auditing those labs and regulatory bodies, lot of regulatory bodies like FDA, USP, NSF, there, there are ISOs. So these regulatory bodies come time to time and they inspect everything. So you have to like <clears throat> check what is the status, where you stand and how you can improve from that <laughs> level. And the standards based on these pillars and blocks, we <clears throat> maintain those standards. Those standards like are uh, site, uh, like if we are having a laboratory, the upper management review, what are our test failures, what are our complaints, validation standard, status are okay, external audit, any corrective and preventive actions we are having on place. And if there is nothing there, so how we can maintain that and we can improve those. So this is very important aspects as well. Other uh, <clears throat> Other standards like which we maintain based on these in the independent reporting, trained and competence and re result disposition. So we can uh, dispose results very well and without any hesitation, we are not having, without making any mistakes, not reporting like wrong, wrong results. Uh, we adhere in the process and uh, record the successful change implements if there is a change. So if we follow those like, uh, standards which I discussed, so we can do that as well. Again, do, uh, in this, what we can achieve next is like the we we, have, we will have the trained personnel by doing that, like self inspecting and reviewing the process. So if our like suppose our analysts are not trained, so we are going to train them. Our scientists are not trained, we are going to train them, and we will uh, train them at that level. Like they are like highly competitive, and they can make decision by their own or their self. So that's very important aspects as well. <clears throat> and uh, other thing is uh, like what, what we are going to achieve index and, and period, periodic training. Like if uh, <clears throat> time to time we, we provide them uh, training to the staff. Sometime if we think we are not having that training available in house, so we send them in different labs, we send them, them in different organization where those trainings are available and they become competent and they can prove like highly qualitative and quantitative results. So uh, um, other aspects like we, 
we controlled all the creative activity uh, all the management retention policy or uh, or any documents and which can be easily retrieved by following those guidelines we defined those practice uh, <clears throat> master plans and uh, if there is a periodic revalidation because if we are changing anything in a single step in the process so that the validation is uh, done and we are having those documentation so we uh, we capture that as well so these are the main things like uh, where uh, next is test quality review statistical data like uh, we are producing the high quality statistical data if there is any any change re review we <clears throat> we are having that control chain view so we if we are changing anything we capture that and then there is less chance of any vulnerability vulnerability in our lab so that is very important and based on finally like based on this uh, <clears throat> Since current state of pillars versus regulatory audits, when we get any feedback from regulatory agencies or we get any comments, so how we are going to address those comments? Like if we are having a, a comments, how we are address those comments? Where we address those comments, we have to show through corrective and pre preventive action. And we have to verify that all these are captured very well and we are documented those all corrective and preventive actions. So when we talk about the quality standards, a uh, program like how we do in our laboratory, uh, we are having the four fillers for this. First thing is <clears throat> know it. Like even we are, if we uh, are developing a method, we know how we are going to develop it, what, we, what is required for this. When we develop that method, we have, have to go like, if the, there is still improvement, how we can see the improvement, uh, we can verify this, uh, like uh, sending analysts the blind samples and we can ask them to test and we can find out if they are doing it. Uh, very well so then we know that they are doing if there is any lack so we can improve that process hello is there an issue no sir uh, you can continue sir okay sorry because there was some instrument and then uh, other step is like have it. Do we have the documents, uh, all the improvements we did, all the method we developed? So we have to have those things. And the next thing is when we have everything, so do it. So you can go like with full pace and you can do like everything that you have, all the evidence of the execution of documents as written documents. And then you can uh, start that process. And I, I don't think so there will be any issue in future and if there is any minor issue like which you are open for you can <clears throat> improve anytime your process if there is any new method or any other step come up you can develop so uh, based on this i would say prevention is better than cure like uh, if we know before if we are dealing uh, before going anything wrong so we can handle it better. If we are like waiting, oh no, the things get to be deteriorated and then we will do, uh, we will take care of this. That's not a good thinking. So we have to be like proactive and we have to be proactively like work on that. So in a formal quality system in the laboratory should prevent mistake by means of quality assurance measures. So quality assurance, what they do <clears throat> in the lab, they check all the quality control of the analytical test results. They review thorough documentation of the systems, <clears throat> efficient, efficient maintenance of the record, and regular audits of all aspects of the system. So they like they do a regular audit as well. Like if the lab or the organization is following all those procedures effectively. <clears throat> 
And now I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit about the microbiology because I'm, uh, my, my background is microbiology and in microbiology, there are uh, two major areas of microbiology. And fortunately, like I'm trained in both areas. Like, I did my postdoctoral fellowship. And after that, I work almost like uh, 10 years in clinical microbiology testing where I work on antimicrobial drugs as well as like development of clinical microbial diagnostic assay. And other uh, important aspects is industrial microbiology testing where uh, it's fall under like food, pharma, cosmetics. Uh, most of the like <clears throat> in Western countries, most of the food, whatever you are developing in a, a small labs, that's not to be tested before going into the market. You cannot release a product without testing. So you have to look all the microbial contamination issues. So this is very important aspect. So in the uh, next slides, we are going to mainly focus on because I cannot cover both uh, industrial as well as clinical microbiology testing in uh, this task. Maybe <clears throat> in this talk, maybe some other time I will discuss in clinical microbiology testing, but here I'm going to focus on industrial microbiology testing. So uh, in, when we talk about the industrial microbiology techniques, so there are some uh, guidelines, standard regulatory guidelines, like how we can test any product. First is like developed by USP, which is United States Pharmacopoeia. It is a well-known organization. They are having office here in India as well in Hyderabad. Uh, one of our like fellow here from Hyderabad, he audited us last week. So therefore I know that very well. And uh, we are highly collaborating with uh, USP almost 90% of our products which we are developing is certified by USP. So we are having a very good collaboration with United States Pharmacopoeia. So I'm uh, like interacting every month with them time to time and uh, how we can develop new methods, how we can develop new guidelines. So uh, we regularly provide feedback to them as well. <clears throat> Other uh, important organization which you know very well and which we are, they are having the compendial microbiology me methods, uh, FDA. FDA, every, everybody, I'm sure everybody aware about that FDA. FDA in US, it is a big organization and they audit everything like which is uh, consumable <clears throat> things cannot go without auditing them. So any food or drug item, this is in the market, they are going to audit that. And they are having some microbiological, uh, bacteriological analytical methods, so, which is called BAM. And these methods are available online, FDA BAM. So you can access those methods and you can find those standards for testing like E. coli, Pseudomonas, Ishtaporias, total viable count, total plate counts, Eastern mold. So how you have to follow. Other, uh, one of the important, uh, organization which is Swiss based uh, organization in Europe and it's very important <clears throat> like very recognized which is called ISO so they they have developed their own methods as well so you can follow those guide uh, methods or if you are even if you are following those methods you have to verify with your products so <clears throat> How these methods work, uh, microbi microbial limit testing, so which is important aspects of microbial limit testing in any products, and these microbial limit testing can be done by two ways. First is like when we say microbial enumeration test, microbial enumeration test is mostly indicator microorganisms. When we say indicator microorganisms, so here we test mostly total plate count or total uh, aerobic microbial counts as well as eastern mold counts and sometimes sometime coliform counts as well. So these enumeration assays like uh, they are uh, generally it is developed based on the risk analysis like they are not uh, harmful for uh, humans up to a certain limit. So that's why these development methods. So they, based on these regulatory guidelines, it is allowed like uh, there are certain counts allowed for those type of bacteria in the food products. 
other is test or test of other as type of assay is test of specified organism microorganism when we talk about test of specified microorganism these microorganism are uh, mainly pathogenic microbes like e coli staphylococcus salmonella listeria uh, burkholder specia so there are so many <coughs> microorganisms so these are the specified organism tests so we have to perform those those tests and those tests de depend on the risk analysis like which food products or which edible item for which pharma like drugs are having what type of risk so based on this you have to develop those <clears throat> and these are mostly like presence absence test when we say presence absence so most of the uh, like regulatory guidelines accept absence of these uh, uh, <coughs> contaminated like uh, these uh, pathogenic microbes in the any food or drugs item so we are not allowing anything in those uh, like microorganism in those items so only like uh, here you can allow that uh, under microbial enumeration test and why we allow that because if we allow suppose if we put 100 1000 cfu per gram for item so we know if like the count is more so over the period of time there are chances that they can adulterate food or they can change the quality of the food or drug sometimes you say see color change or anything that's or maybe they can produce toxins which is not good for health like uh, for example i am giving here one example is staphylococcus and it is well known like uh, when uh, you are eating any food and staphylococcus is in low count it's not uh, in edible food it's allowed but when it comes like uh, uh, up to certain limits but it is well known like it's uh, published by research like mostly staphylococcus produce cigatoxins when it is more than like uh, <clears throat> a 100000 cfu per gram in the product so then it start developing some uh, producing some toxins which can be uh, which can cause diarrhea or any other diseases <clears throat> so uh, how these standards are created so they, there is lot of background work which like uh, mostly regular lab don't see those works but these standards like <clears throat> develop if you see the, this here professional regulators and industry they are collaborated together in when i talking about the professionals these are the like academicians researchers so they involved that then industry experts industry experts are mostly uh, coming from those professions like they are highly trained scientists or experts and then the regulators like which are sitting in these organizations so all these come together and then they start <clears throat> developing those methods they do lot of uh, risk analysis as well as like background work validation work and then they develop those methods and these always develop through a conscious based process it's not like uh, it can develop uh, uh, within like one or two years sometimes it takes uh, several years to develop those type of methods before coming into the market like some methods you, which you see diagnostic test coming into the market and uh, which is approved by these agencies so it takes like several years to develop otherwise like there are some methods in the lab but these are research purpose only but you, you cannot use that into uh, releasing any food or drug products in the market <clears throat> and uh, one of the most important thing here like the uh, with this approach most of the laboratory scientists they may, they have the interaction with the regulatory bodies so they know what is the regulatory requirements and they learn that regulatory requirements because in, in most of the lab, uh, research lab or uh, university lab these regulatory requirements never discussed and never explained very well 
So they know very well science, but what are the requirements for developing those methods? Most of the scientists lack in starting. So they gain, the, they gain that knowledge, and this is very important aspects to develop those methods. <clears throat> So uh, how we, uh, uh, what is the approach for microbial quality testing <clears throat> and how we do that understanding, how is uh, developed that. Microbiologists need to have an understanding of engineering regulation, the R&D process and production workflows. So uh, the microbiologists which are uh, involved in those uh, developments, so they, they need to that, like what engineering is required. Suppose if we are developing a, a rapid method, PCR method, or any uh, RT lamp method, or anything like we need to know <clears throat> which engineering is required. How is uh, how feasible the equipment? How like uh, how we can handle the? What is the regulation required for this development? What is the R and D process for the development research and development process? And how the production workflow is going for that assay? So we have to know about all those aspects. Other is the microbiologist is expected to understand industrial process as well. Like they have to understand how the any industry, suppose if you are going, every industry is having their own process. Pharma industry is having different process. Food industry is having different process, little bit. Although like uh, base is same, but uh, regulation is a little bit uh, different for all those. Cosmetic index, industry is having different process. So, <clears throat> so they have to uh, understand those process when they are going into the industry. How effectively evaluate microbial risk, which is a, a very important, as I said. It's depend like what is the root of the infection of the microbes and what is the risk of that particular product which we are having uh, making. If we are making suppose a drug, so what is the like uh, risk in that particular drug? So that's depend lot of factors like what is the moisture level because moisture uh, can develop. If the moisture is, uh, level is low, so some of the microbes you can note, uh, for example, if uh, you are having a edible product, so you don't have to test uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, but if you are, because it's mostly cause in the infection on the skin and wounds, particularly it uh, cause inf wound infections. So therefore, like if you are developing a cosmetic product and applying your on your skin, like lotions of gels and food, so then you have to uh, test for pseudomonas aeruginosa. This, <clears throat> and so you have to think about that. Like uh, then there is a a list of organisms based in uh, like all these uh, regulatory bodies which develop USP, European Pharmacopoeia under microbial limit test and FDA BAM as well. But you have to think beyond that. They are having a certain limit. If you are a good scientist, so you have to uh, think like what might be other risk. Them? And if there is a new microorganism emerging, is that microorganism is having any risk for that particular type of products? So think beyond that, like what is written in the regulation. And then you can recommend those like, oh, there is the things. And we think there might be a risk. Even you can recommend those bodies and they, they review all your recommendations open-mindedly. As I already mentioned, like risk assessment to assess whether an organism is ob objectionable. When I'm saying objectionable, uh, which is a more appropriate word in industry world, because if we say pathogenic, I mean here pathogenic, if we say pathogenic, so then everybody gets scored, oh, it's pathogenic, it will cause infection and this and that. And they think like the uh, pathogenic means they think, oh, it's going to spread like uh, COVID. So that's why like uh, uh, non-microbiologists, they think in very uh, different way, like the microbiologist approach is different, but non-microbiologist. Uh, who is going to consume the products? They are having the different approach. <clears throat> uh, 
other like, other thing is like when we are making any products so what are the materials we are using if we are using the materials making those products so we have to assess the risk in those materials as well and based on these all those factors we have to design test methods so we it's goes like that how to assess if an organism is pathogenic or objectionable the foremost factor is whether the organism is a pathogen for if the organism is known to be have a pathogen so you can uh, search the literature and you can find out the like if it is a pathogenic or non pathogenic through literature you can find lot of there are only few organ new only new organism where maybe you are not uh, aware like if it is pathogenic or not non pathogenic then depends on the next important factor is as i already mentioned uh, in previous slides root of infection is the same of the root of administration which is very important uh, as i gave the example of pseudomonas aeruginosa so before so root of infection is very important if root of administration like if you are having a intestinal suppose uh, you are using a product and you didn't test that salmonella and you are eating that product salmonella or listeria both and even e coli both are causing all these organisms which i am giving examples are causing uh, diarrhea so if you are consuming so you have to test those products for like root of infection and uh, on the top of that i gave three examples salmonella listeria and e coli suppose if it is a protein rich products the risk is more for listeria contamination if it is not a proteinous product so less protein there is no protein in the product the risk of listeria growing in that product is very low so how you, how you assess that so uh, and other important factor is the way by which uh, objectionable microorganism trigger a risk to the product or have potential to cause patient harm so that's need to be understand as well like uh, how it can cause uh, a patient more harm so these are the factors like you have to when you are assessing so you have to assess all these factors and you can find out like which organism is uh, <clears throat> more pathogenic or less pathogenic <clears throat> i i want to give here a exam an example here and this is uh, burkholderia cepacia complex this is a complex when it was uh, detected few years back so <coughs> so the scientists find out like uh, it is a, a group of almost 20 species of gram negative non spore forming road set bacteria and it is highly like uh, pathogenic bacteria and uh, it's uh, cause lot of infection and it's come through food but it's come through certain type of foods so uh, mostly this uh, bacterial cepacia is a human respiratory opportunistic pathogen so if you are inhaling any product so you have to test those products for particularly for burkholderia cepacia burkholder cepacia complex bacteria found in and it's always found in the environment especially in soil and water it is not going to cause you infection like if you are touching it but if uh, you touch the bacteria and you touch your nose it definitely or respiratory tract so it is going to cause you infection so they, these are the factors like when you are developing a products like uh, how we are going to either we are going to test for this product for this uh, burkholderia burkholderia cepacia or not so we have to de determine that so uh, when it was determined uh, lately in 2017 and there are some respiratory infection determined by that then fda sent out an alert notification after sending the alert notification from the fda then uh, regulatory uh, bodies started developing a method immediately and in 2019 usp developed a compendial method and it's it's mentioned in the usp chapter 60 so there is a special cha chapter for this so this you can where you can find all the information how we are going to test this for uh, which pro which type of products need to be tested so that's the approach we take like for developing that <clears throat> 
So when we say like uh, developing a method, it's, it's look very easy. Oh, yeah, we, we can develop it and it's very easy. We can develop in the lab, we can develop RT, RT-PCR, PCR or anything. And uh, it's look very uh, easy, but based on like uh, feedback from the regulatory agencies and their restrictions and allowance, it is not that easy to develop a method. It takes time, as I, I, I already mentioned uh, to you guys. So microbiology testing mainly falls under the following categories I, as a quali qualitative testing for the absence of any pathogenic bacteria in the products. Quantitative test for like a limit test where you allowed any indicator organism present in the samples. Uh, Quantitative test for the potency or uh, toxicity, like what is the level of toxins, like most of the pharma products, we test for endotoxin detections. And uh, you have to find out like what is the endotoxins level, levels in that product. And what are the identification tests for these type of samples like microbes? So uh, how you can identify and which identification test is best best for identifying it quickly. So, <clears throat> next uh, approach is like when we are developing a method because we have a lot of traditional methods and traditional method mainly agar-based method. And this agar-based method is uh, like gold standard uh, for uh, any analytical testing in microbiology. But nowadays like uh, the... Uh, Environment is fast paced environment and every company they want like or every, every organization they want to deliver the results very quickly. So based on this, the rapid microbiology methods can be developed, but how we are go going to develop those methods, that's going to be very important as well. So all these rapid microbiology methods aim to provide more sensitive, accurate, precise, and reproducible test results when compared with conventional growth-based methods. Accuracy, uh, and these, this should be depends on the accuracy, faster results, like uh, mostly, as I mentioned, like this gold standard agar-based method, they are taking time and sometimes it takes five to seven days to produce the results. Within like, uh, by using the rapid microbiology methods, we can, produce results within 24 hours in most of the cases. These methods involve some form of automation. So that, that is very important factor automation, like where analyst involvement is very low and why automation is required when we are developing the rapid microbiology methods, because uh, microbes like uh, uh, they are opportunistic pathogens and most of the microbes develop on our skins, our mouth, our nose. So if the microbiologist is heavily involved, so there are chances like we can control, uh, contaminate that uh, laboratory test as it, ourselves as well. So when we say automation, so in that uh, process, there is like less interaction of the analyst to that automation process. Once you prepare the samples under biosafety hood, you can upload the sample and everything will be done like uh, running the sample on the automation and then producing the results, preparing the report. So you will get just the final reports. This type of systems are coming now into the market. As I said, mentioned like, <clears throat> Uh, based on this, like uh, you capture all the data electronically, so there is no, there is no chance to <clears throat> there is no chance like uh, to forge those data, and then you reduce any human error because when uh, analyst is working, it's uh, no matter who is working and what uh, we are doing in the lab, we are human and we make the mistake, so uh, that can reduce that human error if we are having those automation system. So uh, what is the consideration for when we are developing like uh, the rapid microbiology methods? So what we consider, consider before developing those methods? 
so we have to always keep in mind what do i want to achieve like what i'm going to achieve by developing these methods so if my goal is like to develop a method uh, so i have to develop okay if gold standard method like agar based method is giving results in 48 hours can i do in 8 hours or 16 hours or uh, 24 hours so that's like how are i'm going to budget how how much budget do i have another important factor is the budget like suppose uh, every lab fast paced lab or a regular lab they see like if there is equipment of 100000 and you develop a equipment of uh, $20 so everybody is going to get the equipment which you, they can achieve in $20 they are not going to develop so you have to always keep in mind that any rapid method should be like less expensive so that should be your priority when you are developing that how fast like what is the time uh, which technologies are available like there are so many technologies for rapid methods are available i'm not going to discuss those te- technology here but there are so many technologies available and <clears throat> you can like find out which technology will work for this particular method uh, and how you can move forward with that technology and what is your technology is uh, better than other technologies so you have to keep that in mind as well and when you are developing that of course uh, what are any if there is any paper published or any uh, published data be- on those methods or that technologies you have you have to review that first and you have to look pro and cons for those technologies before developing uh, if there is any uh, statement or any comments from the regulatory bodies about that technology so you have to look that as well you have to search that data as well and you can find out so you 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 will get the good feedback to develop a method uh, so this is the like uh, background work bef- before develop de- developing a method <clears throat> what is in uh, what is involved in method development when we are developing suppose we develop a method but validation is required for any uh, method development so validation before validate uh, without validation you cannot release that methodology or that technology into the market and nobody is going to buy that technology at all if your method is not fully validated with the proven records and they are not showing and once you bring that technology if you are not developing you are bringing trying to bring that technology in the lab still you have to develop what are the testing you are doing against that you have to show the suitability of those methods so if there an internal change control process in the laboratory so you have to uh, <clears throat> look that for the you have to immediately develop the do the method validation regulatory process like as i said because if method is not developed regulatory uh, bodies will not allow you so you have to look all those regulatory requirements for the which i'm going to what is the regulatory requirement i'm going to discuss in next slide which uh, agencies do i know to approach where i to i i should go and approach for the me- method validation uh, what data i need for the s- approval of that uh, suppose you are developing a diagnostic kit so uh, what data you need to develop like for if you are de- uh, sending uh, to fda so what needs you need the Uh, approval from fda or any other agency for that method you have to look for their guidelines and you have to read those guidelines very carefully and you have to follow those guidelines how long it will take for the approval and for these approvals even when you submitted the data to the agencies sometimes it takes like six six months to one year to review those process and it takes almost that time what will be needed for a regulatory submission as i said like uh, you have to look each and every document which is required for the submission and they they give in detail uh, in their guidelines fda guidelines like uh, where you can find all those details and how this validation work which is a very important factor as i mentioned in the last slide like uh, what 
factors you have to prove that your method is validated and it's working well. So these method validation studies, after developing the method, you have to perform in uh, the validation and you have to use the following up approach. First thing is accuracy. You have to prove like your method is accurate. And you have to, <clears throat> you, uh, you can prove it like based on the number of replication or number of samples. How, how precise is your method next is precision. Precision is very important factor as well. You have to precise, you have to prove that your method is precise and it work well for like with a certain number of samples. Then uh, ruggedness comes like if a two analyst is working so, or three analyst is working. So still this working is fine. Suppose, Sometimes what happened, uh, like there are, uh, every analyst is having different approach and you have to make that method, like no matter who, who is doing that method or who is analyzing the sample. So that work well. So at least three or four analysts or three or four different labs, it should be tested and it should work very well and with the same sample size. Robustness, like how robust your methods, like how, suppose if a method is working at a certain temperature, so how it is going to work for that <clears throat> temperature or if there is any other factors like incubation time, uh, temperature, so uh, it's uh, bear some uh, sort of temperature, suppose if it is working at 35, so is it okay? Mm, this method plus minus two degree Celsius temperature and it will work well. So you have to prove that specificity, which is a very important aspect as well. When we talk about specificity, like uh, suppose you develop a method for some particular organism, is the method specific enough to detect or it is detecting any other stuff as well. So specificity, you have to prove that as well. Next is limit of detection, limit of detection and sensitivity, which is a very important aspect. How sensitive your method is well and like uh, uh, it will go up to one microbial cells or it is uh, detecting up to 10 microbial cells. So you have to prove that like, okay, if it is a pres presence of sense test, so you have to uh, show the regulatory agencies like even our method can detect one microbial cells in the sample. So that should be that sensitivity and limit of detection. So you have to prove that as well. Other important aspects is inclusivity and uh, inclusivity and exclusivity. And as per FDA guidelines, at least uh, you have to take inclusivity at least 50 a species of the same organism or stain, a different type of stains of the same organism, and you have to test those against that method, and you have to prove that all the stains are detectable by using this method. Exclusivity, you have to take other species, at least 30 species, and you have to show that it cannot detect those 30 species. So that's you have to include those, those as well method developments. And uh, next is the equivalency, which is very important. Like when you are developing a method and you want to implement that in your lab or want to sell it in uh, <clears throat> like open market, then you have to show the equivalency with the regular like uh, agar, pl agar plate method. Like if uh, it is equivalent to agar plate method or not. So that's very important aspects as well. So you have to work on that as well. So how you can develop a uh, method and you can validate that. And once it's validated, you have did every steps here, then, and every step is working well, then you can uh, have all the records, you show the records, you put the report, validation reports together, and then you can run that, you can submit that for the uh, like approval from those agencies, regulatory agencies, and then, uh, I don't see like there is any issue, like they will not approve your method, but you have to prove all those steps before approving the method. And then you can sell it in the market. <clears throat>
and uh, there are uh, some guidelines for method validation where you can find uh, mm -hmm. in European pharmacopoeia there is a chapter which is called alternative methods for quality control of microbial quality so they have the guidelines like how you can develop those uh, and validate those methods in usp the chapter number is 1223 validation of alternative microbial microbiological methods based on these you can uh, validate those methods FDA is also having the guidelines like guidelines for the validation of analytical methods for the detection of microbial pathogens in foods and feeds. And then uh, if you are following the ISO guidelines, so there is a chapter uh, like uh, method ISO 16140, validation of alternative microbiology methods against a reference method. So you can follow those guidelines for the validating a method and you can successfully develop a method finally. Uh, like I want to give you an example, uh, probiotic uh, products, and we are developing a lot of probiotic products and I'm heavily involved in this probiotic research and we are having a lot of collaborators in the US. Like right now we are developing a lot of <clears throat> probiotic test method because it is a new and uh, why it is required because it is required based on regulatory guidelines. When we develop a probiotic for a products, we always say that this probiotic products contain, suppose if it is a yogurt or we don't have the yogurt though because we are a dietary supplement company. So we are having mostly uh, two piece capsules or uh, some tablets or soap gels with the probiotics and gummies. So you have to prove like if you are claiming something, we are having 10 billion probiotics and these, there are two probiotics, mainly uh, lactobacillus and bifidobacteria, two species, but these two genus are having a lot of species and in those species, each species are having different strains. So nowadays is a <clears throat> trend in probiotic industry because each probiotics is having some some of them are good for your gut, some of them are good for your, um, uh, like enhancing your immunity. So therefore most of the industry nowadays in US, what they are doing, they are you selecting certain strains and they are mixing that together and probi making those products. Like uh, we recently developed a product which are having 12 strains, uh, seven, seven strains of lactobacillus, species and five stains from bifidobacteria. So these 12 stains are having in one probiotic uh, capsules. So these stains, so when we are having those stains, so we have to prove to the regulatory agencies, okay, if we are using those stains, did we put the right bacteria in our product, right stain, because there are so many stains, if we are claiming that particular stains, and it is very easy for going like uh, uh, ID at species level, you can do like a ID by using the sequence method, PCR method, mostly like <clears throat> for a, this type of bacteria. But when it goes to stains, then it is very complicated because stains, each stains is having one or two uh, nucleotide difference only. And based on that, like sometimes we have to go whole, whole genome sequencing for that. And we have to do whole genome sequencing to prove that our products are having that particular stain in there. Other, other complicated st step is that by developing those methods, which we are facing now and working it very like uh, rapidly on those methods. Other complicated, when it is a mixed system, then it is, you cannot do, you cannot prove that anything based on even like how many cells you put for that particular uh, stain in that product based on the count method, because on the plate, bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, both colonies look like same on the plate. So that's very difficult. So this is like a, re a regulatory, it's very uh, like it's a challenge still and it's a new field so we are working on that but we developed some guidelines and uh, i gave a lot of feedback to this chapter uh, which is developed recently in 2020 
to testing the probiotic testing, like uh, how we are going to count and how we are going to do IDs. So the uh, initial chapter is put, which is called USP chapter 64. And it's developed and it's now in use, but it's still a lot of work needs to be done for particularly at identifying at the stain levels, which we are working right now. <clears throat> Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sorry to interrupt you, sir. Sir, so session will be automatically closed at 1 a.m. Okay. Oh. <laughs> now the session is open for the discussion and query. If anyone asks that. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, uh, any participant want to ask any question? Any queries there? Hello. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much for sharing your views. Uh, that's all for today's session, keynote session. Now, now we are moving towards the closing of pre lunch session of first day of conference. Closing of pre lunch session of the first day of conference. It was great to hear from our keynote speakers about the influence, priorities, development, and comparison to international standards in the same field. So, after keynote session today, we will have two parallel sessions in our post lunch schedule. These sessions are named as session A and session B. These, uh, these sessions are theme based sessions as mentioned in the schedule, in which the session A include theme one and theme three, and the session B will include theme two and theme four. Approximately 17 uh, participants. Dr. Dr. Garima, Dr. Garima, uh, kindly, uh -huh. mention, uh, kindly mention the name of the theme also. Right. Okay, ma'am. A, what is B? Okay, ma'am. So, in the post lunch session of oral presentation, the theme for uh, session A and session B are as follows Theme one is for soil and agricultural biotechnology, theme two is on industrial and microbial biotechnology, theme three is for food biotechnology and microbiology, theme four is aquaculture and marine biotechnology. There will be two parallel sessions. Session A include theme one and theme three that is related to soil and agriculture and food biotech. So uh, I'm requesting to the participants, please join the link uh, which belongs to your uh, theme. And uh, the presentation uh, will be in these two sessions parallelly. I'm requesting to all the participants, judges, expertise, kindly join these sessions through the provided link on the group. Each session is having separate meeting link for presentations. Presentations will be done according to the given schedule. I am again requesting to the delegates, scholars and participants, kindly join the link according to your theme to reduce the discrepancy. So we are also eager to hear from you about your ideas and innovations in the field. Kindly note down your time slot and try to be extract to the point to express your views in the time frame given to you. We wish you all the best and thank you all for your presence and participation. One more information regarding the uh, presentation session. These two sessions uh, are modified. The theme one and theme three will be moderated by Dr. Ritu and theme two and theme four will be moderated by Dr. Sanjukta. And the link will be provided by Dr. Ritu and Dr. Sanjukta separately. So be aware of these links and uh, join your own link. Thank you for uh, today and best of luck for the presentation. We will meet again after lunch at 1.30. So join us uh, with the two separate links at 1.30. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Garima. And it is my request to all the participants and all the uh, keynote speakers and whoever present uh, in this international conference on advances of biotechnology and applied microbiology. Uh, the link is available. The whole talk, the whole conference uh, opening ceremony is available on the YouTube channel. 
and shortly it will be uh, available after just uh, finishing this conference. So it is expected to you, uh, all of you to kindly share as much as you can. Thank you so much. And we'll meet after lunch. So I am just ending the meeting uh, right now. Uh, again, thank you, all the keynote speakers. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, ma'am.